Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to a world where fears and suspense are the order. In cities and towns of North Africa, it's a common sight to see an old man sitting in the public square, surrounded by an admiring crowd who squat on their haunches as they listen to an age-old tale of courage, of romance, but above all, of mystery. Like that old man, the public teller of tales, I have a story for you. A story that takes place in our own country, which deals in matters that defy explanation. Matters which can be explained only from the tomb. What are you doing, you? What are you shooting at? Don't ask questions. Just fire while I reload. Fire at what? Straight ahead of you, where the grave is moving. You, what are we doing? What is it? <laughs> You, you saw it this time, didn't you? You saw the movement, the blurry outline of a shape. I saw a movement, but nothing else. Well, where are your eyes, Bill? It was there. You just had a look and you'd have seen it. I think. What the devil are you talking about, you? Seen what? You know, the thing. The damn thing. <laughs> mystery drama, The Damned Thing, was inspired by the celebrated American writer Ambrose Bierce. It was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Robert Dryden and Joan Tompkins. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. By the light of a kerosene lamp placed at one end of a rough wooden table, a tall, gaunt man is reading something written in a book. The man reads silently as his fingers trace the words. As the man lifts the book toward the light, the shadows cast by the ledger throw half of the small room into darkness, obscuring the faces of seven men sitting against the log walls of the little cabin. On the other side sit three people, two women 
and a man, an elderly Indian, all equally silent, equally motionless. Next to them is an empty chair. By extending an arm, any one of them can touch the man who is lying on the table, face upward, covered by a sheet, his arms at his side. The man, Hugh Morgan, is dead. The man with the book is the district coroner. They all seem to be waiting for someone to occupy the empty chair. Finally, the tall man closes the book. There are three things to determine at this inquest. The identity of the deceased, the time of death, and finally the mode of the departure, the manner in which his life came to an end. There's no question of identity. These have been positively confirmed as the remains of Hugh Morgan, famous scientific book writer and until three years ago well-known professor at the State University. Upon resigning from the university, he came up here to our mountains with Mrs. Morgan to get away from city life, to get what he called closer to nature. He built this cabin pretty much with his own hands. Is that a fair statement, Ms. Morgan? That's correct, Mr. Bentley. The time of death has been determined by medical examination as between 36 and 48 hours ago. We are now waiting for Mr. William Harker, the young newspaper fellow from San Francisco, former student of Professor Morgan's. His testimony, we are led to believe, may be of the greatest importance in this determination. Until such time as he arrives, we shall proceed with the investigation. I first call on the wife, the widow of the demised. Now, Ms. Morgan, if you please. Yes. Would you kindly repeat to these gentlemen what you've already told me about how your late husband met his death? My husband loved these mountains. Second only to his work, his, his writing. He loved nothing more dearly than walking, hunting, fishing, in all seasons, all kinds of weather. No, of course. Uh, tell us, please, about the visits of young Mr. Harker. Well, as you've already stated, Mr. Harker is a newspaper man, a former student, a, a protege of Professor Morgan's. He had visited with us for a few days five or six weeks ago. You do not like Mr. Harker, do you, Miss Morgan? No, I do not. I have my reasons. Did anything unusual happen during Harker's first visit? Five or six weeks ago? Nothing, uh, uh, except for the dog. The dog? The hunting dog, Sandy. Professor Morgan and Harker went hunting. Sandy was horribly mutilated by some other animal and he died. I'd never seen Harker so upset after all those things happen. Then Mr. Harker's second visit? Three days ago. There was something he said he wanted to talk to my husband about... Something that had happened on that first visit. It had to do with money. I was in the kitchen, and I distinctly remember hearing my husband say... But, Bill, a debt is a debt, and $5,000 is a lot of money. I know that, Hugh. And if I can nail this story down, write it so it makes sense, so people will believe it, I'll get that 5000 as a bonus. And I'll return it to you. Well, I hope so, Bill. It's been almost four years, and we need the money. Trust me. Just help me get this story. Well, I don't know what you expect me to do. All we have to do is go back to where Sandy got hurt. Well, it's one thing for a dog. Now, suppose, just, just suppose... Stop worrying. Well, what makes you think you can write it so that the paper will take it? With your help, I can do it. Get your gun. I've got it. Is it loaded? Of course. All right, let's go. And the two of them left the cabin. Both with loaded guns. Uh, what time of the day was it, Miss Morgan? It wasn't day. It was night. Night before last. Clear, bitterly cold. It was a sharp night. I remember looking out the window after them. They had been gone no more than five minutes when I heard the strangest sound. 
It's hard to describe to you. And then almost immediately there was a scream. And then two shots, one right after the other. And then, Miss Morgan? A few minutes later, young Harker burst into the cabin looking as if he'd seen a ghost. He could hardly speak. When he was able to catch his breath, he said, Mrs. Morgan, he was dead. Killed. Who killed him, Mr. Harker? I don't know. I was right there. And heaven help me. I don't know. And it's your feeling, Miss Morgan, that... My husband was a big man, sir. A strong man. He played football at college wrestling team, too. The only thing he couldn't do was swim. But he was in perfect health. And Mr. Harker's a very slight young man. No match physically for my husband. Which leads you to believe... To do away with Hugh, Harker needed his gun. In other words, you're convinced that the shots you heard... Had to come from William Harker's hunting rifle. A double-barreled gun. Harker's motive being... To wipe out Hugh and his debt to him at the same time. Uh, For the time being, I must ask these gentlemen of the jury to question what you are implying. You see, there is some doubt whether Mr. Harker or anybody else could possibly have shot your husband. Why is that? Because the condition of the body is such that at this time, we cannot tell whether or not it contains so much as a single bullet wound. I call now on Miss Viola May Atwater. Miss Atwater? Call me Viola May, like everyone else does. Uh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, now, uh, it's been previously established, Miss At. Uh, Viola May, that you work here in the Morgan household? Worked. And your duties were? Keeping the place clean, doing some of the cooking, especially when Mrs. Morgan wasn't feeling just right. Oh, driving to town in the wagon for supplies and... Mm Mm-hmm. Professor Morgan was in love with you, wasn't he? Well, wouldn't exactly call it love. But we did get along quite well. I'd like for you to tell us all how well. I'm going to have Hugh's child. That's how well. Thank you, Viola May. Now, you do understand why we're all here, don't you? Well, I think so. This is not a trial. No one is being accused of anything yet. We're just trying to find out the truth. We just want to know what happened night before last. I can tell you. Please do. You know how it was between the professor and me. And for the longest time, he'd been telling me he was going to get rid of Mrs. Morgan. Some way. But now, she ain't such a fool. She didn't know what was going on. Well, night before last, I was in the kitchen doing the supper dishes... I couldn't help hearing every word they said. How much longer do you think I'm going to put up with this? No one's asking you to put up with anything. A man your age, a man of your reputation. Having a sordid affair with a stupid, ignorant girl. Where's your pride? That stupid, ignorant girl is something you never had. That is pretty obvious, dear. I'm talking about things like like compassion. In her own simple way, she has a a warmth and a tenderness that you've never shown in all the years of our marriage. She understands you, doesn't she? You poor miss. And there's something else, since you've started it. Viola May is going to have my child. I know. I want that child to have my name. I want a divorce. Simple as that. Simple as that. Before I'd let you throw yourself away on a girl like that... And before I'd let you toss me aside like some old worn-out shoe, I'd kill you first. I'm sure you would. Don't push me to where I'd have to prove it. Excuse me, ma'am. The dishes are done. Kitchen's in order. Is there anything else you'd like me to do before I turn in for the night? That'll be all. Thank you. 
Well, then I'll just say good night. Well, Hugh, I'm going for a walk around the lake. I'll go with you. <laughs> if you like. After we get back, you can pay a visit to your little friend. <laughs> Both went out together. Now, what time of the night would you say it was when they left? Oh, 9.30 maybe. 10 at the latest. What'd you do after they left? Straighten things out a little more. And then? Well, they wasn't gone very long. Maybe, oh, maybe five minutes. Not more. When I heard a most peculiar sound, like... Not nothing I'd ever heard before. I, I can't exactly describe what it was like, and, and then almost on top of it, there was a scream that went like this. Go ahead, Viral May. A minute or two later, Mrs. Morgan bust right into the cabin. She couldn't hardly talk. And finally she said, Viral <gasps> May. Mr. Morgan is dead. Drowned in the lake. Mrs. Morgan told you herself that you, um, Professor Morgan, couldn't swim. Now, I think you gentlemen can see for yourselves what happened. The first chance she got, she pushed him into the lake at the part where it's real deep. Now, he struggled for a piece, and in the darkness of the night... Finally give up and drown. I see. As I've explained before, Viola May, this inquest has been called because there is reason to believe that Hugh Morgan met his end through some kind of foul play. Like I said. Mm, not quite like you said. Chances of Professor Morgan's death coming about as a result of drowning are very slim. Medical examination of the body thus far shows that the lungs seem to be perfectly normal. No water in them. Not a drop. Absolute truth is a very strange thing. What seems real to one person is very often a lie to another. The fact, as one person sees it, becomes a fiction in the eye of his neighbor. What, then, is real? And at what point does imagination, for example, color reality? I'll return shortly with Act Two. In an isolated cabin, high in a deserted area of the mountains of Northern California, a corpse lies cold and rigid on a rough, hand-hewn table. The dead man, science writer Hugh Morgan, has come to an unexplained and unnatural end. The district coroner and his jury await the arrival of a man who may turn out to be the key witness in this death. Two other witnesses, the wife and the mistress of the dead man, have already testified. The coroner turns up the wick of the kerosene lamp, calls on a third witness, the elderly Indian, who has been sitting in stony silence, listening. Joe Crowfoot? Yes, sir. Joe, you earn your living as a guide to hunting parties, is that right? Yes, sir. I know every stream, every trail... Like the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. Would you please repeat for the benefit of these gentlemen what you already told me? What happened night before last? It was about 9.30. I'd put out the lamps and was just about to call it a day. Hunting party at five the next morning. I'd just gone out to the rear of my shack when I heard voices. You said you loved me, Hugh. You said I was the only thing in this whole wide world that mattered to you. That's true, Viola May. Then what's all this talk you've given out to me about how the time ain't right for a divorce? It would kill her. I may not love her, but at the same time, I wouldn't want to do anything to hurt her. Ain't you the considerate one? 
You think nothing hurting me. Look out for that snake. Oh. Quick, get back on the path. Oh. Oh, that was close. I, I couldn't see it. Well, how could you? Here. Here, let's sit down on this stump for a minute. And, for heaven's sake, keep, keep your voice down. Joe's asleep, and we don't want to wake him. You got a responsibility, Hugh. I'm going to be mother to your child. So you say. Now, what's that mean? What makes you so sure it's me? Well, who is it? Now, what is in back of that filthy mind of yours? I told you to keep your voice down. I tell the whole world what a dirty old man you really are. You little fool. Now, oh. oh, you pull yourself together. You mock him. I hope you die. You push me. You deliver it. No. no. The rattlesnake, it's there. I can see it. But don't move. Lie I hear as quietly as... It's lifting its head, but... It bit me. Get help. You little idiot, I've been bitten. Wake Joe Crowfoot fast. What makes you think Joe would help you? Wake him up yourself, lover boy. I got more important things to do. Joe! Joe Crowfoot, help! I need help! Help me, somebody! In no time at all. I had him in my shack, did everything I knew to kill the poison the snake had shot into his body. But... Yes, Joe? I guess I was too late. Within a very short time, Professor Morgan was dead. And it is your testimony that he was pushed by the young lady, Viola May, into the spot, the area... Where she knew there was a rattlesnake. Yes, sir. That's very interesting, Mr. Crowfoot. Why do you say that? The medical examination. As far as we can determine, not a trace of the snake's poison is in the bloodstream. Not a trace. Mr. Bentley... I got here as fast as I could. Ah, uh, you, young man, are... Uh, I'm, I'm William Harker of the San Francisco Press. Uh, forgive me if I've held things up. Oh, delighted to see you, Mr. Harker. I left the minute I got your call. Uh, this is not the easiest place to get to. I won't finish this business tonight. Well, I, I think you should know that when I left here early yesterday morning, it was uh, not to evade your summons. No? No, it was uh, to get the story to my paper... The story of Hugh Morgan's death. Now, yeah, Mr. Harker, we've heard three different versions tonight of how Hugh Morgan met his death. And none of them has yet been substantiated by the facts of the medical examination of the body. Now, have we any reason to expect that the account you posted to your newspaper, Mr. Harker, will be anything like the story you will give here? That's up to you, sir. I've made a carbon copy of what I wrote for my paper. You're welcome to see it. It, it, It's incredible. More incredible than pure fiction. But it is the truth. I'll swear to it. All right, we'll resume the inquest. Mr. Harker, would you kindly be seated? Now, you knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. How well? He was my professor at the university. Taught me everything I knew about writing. More than that. He was the closest friend I had. And you were with him when he died? I was with him when he died. How'd that happen? You being here, I mean. Well, I... I came up three days ago to shoot and fish. Uh, Part of my purpose, however, was to follow up on the story of the dog, Sandy. You see, I had been here five weeks earlier... On a purely friendly visit to your old teacher? Well, on that occasion, we went out hunting, as we'd usually done on previous visits. It was still dark. The sun had not yet risen when we left the cabin. Sandy! Sandy! Here, boy! Have you any idea where that silly dog went? Well, he was here a minute ago, you. Funniest thing, he just disappeared. Oh, but he'll be back. In the meantime, we'll have to do without him. Well, now, let's see if we're as good as he is in raising some quail. Uh, What's our best ground? Uh, beyond that ridge, I'd say. 
Yes, we'll have to go through the chaparral to get to it. It's pretty level ground, thickly covered with grain. Uh, let's go, Bill. Hold it, Bill. Hold it. Be very quiet. What is it? Just listen. What is that? I, I think we've startled a deer. Oh, I wish we'd bought a rifle instead of just shot. Shh, be very quiet. What are you doing, Hugh? You're not going to fill up a deer with quail shot, are you? Is anything wrong? Hugh, have we jumped a grizzly? Cock your gun, Bill. Well, now what? Everything's so quiet. What is it? Just keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. Keep low, very low, and watch. And that's exactly what I did. What happened next? A minute or two went by. Suddenly, there was this weird sound that seemed to come from out of nowhere. It grew louder and louder. It got to the point where I had to put my hands over my ears to shut out the sound. It was so shattering. And then it stopped. As suddenly as it had started. And what did you see, Mr. Hart? Well, up until then, the bushes had been deathly still. Not a bit of movement of any kind. I turned to Professor Morgan and was about to speak when the field of wild oats we'd been watching began to move in the most curious way. It seemed as if the oats were being stirred up by a streak of wind, which, well, not only bent it, but pressed it down, crushed it, so that it didn't rise, as if some huge, invisible, what can I call it, presence was moving slowly along through the oats, stepping on it with giant feet. And this movement, foot by foot, was prolonging itself directly toward us. What was your feeling, Mr. Harker, as you were watching this, uh, this strange occurrence? Well, I must confess that I lay there in the chaparral, right beside Professor Morgan, watching this fantastic thing happen, and... I was not afraid. Was this equally true of your companion? No. He was terrified. What are you doing, Hugh? What are you shooting at? Don't ask questions. Just fire while I reload. Fire? At what? Straight ahead of you, where the grain is moving. Well, if you say so. Hugh, what are we doing? <laughs> what is it? All over now, it's gone. Let's see what happened. Yeah. Oh, no. That poor Paul Sandy. Just look at him. Ripped to pieces. As if he'd run into the blades of a, 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 of a threshing machine. But what did it? I, I didn't see anything. Well, you saw the movement, didn't you? And a sort of, a sort of blurry outline of a shape? I saw the movement. Nothing else. So well, where are your eyes, Bill? It was there to see. You just had a look and you'd have seen it. I think. What the devil are you talking about, you? Seen what? The thing. The damned thing. The what? That's what I call it. The damned thing. First, it did away with my chickens and then the pigs and the cattle. And now poor Sandy... Slashed to pieces. And that's not the end. Only the good Lord knows what the damn thing will destroy next. Or who? Is it possible that there is a grain of truth in the incredible story Harker has just told? And can Hugh Morgan's fear of a shapeless, sinister force, of a thing that seems to challenge all reason and logic, be justified? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. From the blank darkness outside the cabin 
come the familiar noises of night in the wilderness. The long, nameless note of a distant coyote. And all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that seem always to have been but half heard when they suddenly cease. But none of the company present seems to be aware of anything other than the corpse on the table before them. Please continue, Mr. Harkey. Well, uh, that's about it. Uh, we buried the dog and went back to the cabin and, and never said another word to each other about what had happened that morning. You stayed on for a while? Uh, no, sir. I, I returned to San Francisco the next day. And then, five, six weeks later, three days ago, you came back again. Why? To fill in some of the blanks. Uh, there were too many unexplained things. Uh, tell us what happened night before last. I think Hugh had a pretty good idea of why I had come back so soon after the episode with the dog. It was he himself who suggested that we go out to hunt whatever might be around. I think our best chances are this way, over this ridge. But Hugh... Isn't that the same ridge where Sandy... Of course it is, of course. Now, just see that your gun is loaded. It's loaded. Good. Keep your eyes and ears open. We've got a full moon and visibility is real good. Now, if anything... Be very quiet, Bill. Do you hear anything? No. Nothing. But just be careful. Be very careful. It comes up on you out of nowhere. It gives you no warning. Right. Let it have it, Bill. Both barrels. And here's mine. I missed it, Bill. I missed it. Run. Uh, Run for your life. You, 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 I don't see anything. What happened? I was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the haze. Something soft and heavy hurled itself against me with great force. Before I could get back to my feet, I heard Morgan crying out in mortal agony. Oh, no. <laughs> mingling, mingling with his cries were hoarse, savage sounds, like from the throats of mad dogs fighting each other to the death, snarling and growling. This time I was terrified. I struggled to my feet. I looked for Professor Morgan and... and and may heaven in mercy spare me from another sight like that. Ah, now, now, easy, Mr. Hart. <laughs> Not 20 yards away, my friend was down on one knee, his head thrown back at a terrifying angle. His hat was gone. His long hair was in disorder. His whole body was convulsed with violent movements from one side to the other, backward and forward. His, his right arm... Yes? It, it was lifted, and it didn't seem to have a hand. At least I could see none. The other arm was completely invisible. Morgan seemed like a, a, a wrestler of some kind, determined... And yet overcome, beaten by a force of superior weight, greater strength. And all this time, all you saw was Morgan? Yeah. Nothing else? Nobody else? No, just him. And then, not always distinctly. And throughout the whole thing, such sounds of rage and fury as I have never heard in my life, from man or beast. Now... What, if anything, did you do to help your friend? Well, I, I ran toward him. I had a funny kind of feeling that, well, that he was suffering from a fit or from some kind of convulsion. I, I looked up, and by the light of the moon, I, I could see as, as I had weeks before, the same mysterious movement of the wild oats retreating, rolling itself back from the place where Hugh lay, toward the edge of the woods. When I got there, I, I I looked down at my friend. He was lying on his back, absolutely still and quiet. He was dead. Yes, 
Gentlemen, you've now heard four different accounts from four different witnesses. Now, finally, there is the version of death in some mysterious manner that Morgan was killed by an unknown force or creature of some kind, which Morgan called the damn thing. Uh, Mr. Bentley, uh, there are two things more I would like to bring to your attention. Yes, Mr. Hark. First, that book you placed under the table, I recognize it as... Professor Morgan's diary. You seem greatly interested in it. In fact, you were reading it while I was testifying. M may I see it? I'm sure it would throw a great deal of light on Morgan's death. The book will cut no figure in this matter, Mr. Harker. All the entries in it were made before Hugh Morgan's death. That's ridiculous. Now, you said there's something else you'd like to bring to our attention before a verdict is rendered? Well, there's one... Substantial bit of evidence which has not yet been revealed. Yes, Mr. Harker? The body of Morgan. I demand that you uncover the body right now so that we can all see whether or not I was telling the truth. I will be happy to meet with your request, Mr. Harker. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen of the jury, the body of Hugh Morgan. Now, it may be difficult to see details in this light. I read from the medical report, gentlemen. The body of the demise is covered with broad maculations of bluish black caused by extravasated contusions. Uh, that's those big black and blue marks here and here and over here. The chest and sides appear to have been beaten with some heavy weapon such as a bludgeon. I call your attention to these huge tears in the flesh where the skin has been ripped into shreds and little strips. And might we know why there's that silk handkerchief passing under the chin and knotted on top of the head? <clears throat> you may indeed... I'll remove it, and I think you'll see why it's there. If it weren't there, <sighs> the head would almost be separate, detached from the rest of the body. What was once the neck and throat have, as you can see, been chewed away. That satisfy you, Mr. Harker? Hey, thank you very much. Now I will ask the jury to adjourn for its verdict. We, the jury, do find that the remains of Professor Morgan come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion. You can't mean that! But just the same as some of us think that the remains was subject to a simple case of fits. Come in. Oh, Mr. Harker. Can't say I'm surprised to see you. To what does my humble office owe the honor of your visit? I, uh, can't accept the verdict your jury gave last night. Well, unfortunately, there ain't much you can do about it. I think there is, sir. I can establish the truth about Hugh Morgan's death. And how exactly do you propose to do that, Mr. Harker? Take a look at this. What is it? A reel of tape and a recording machine. Months ago, I asked Hugh to make a day-by-day -day recording of whatever he saw, whatever he experienced in connection with this phenomenon. Would you like to hear it, Mr. Coroner? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. This might just possibly make you change your mind. Listen carefully. And Sandy kept running in a kind of half circle, keeping his head turned always toward the center. You recognize that as Professor Morgan's voice? Yes, he I do. He kept barking furiously. At last, he ran away into the brush as fast as he could go. At first, I thought maybe he'd gone mad. And then the thought occurred to me, can a dog see... 
with his nose can a dog think with his nose do odors impress on the brain the image of the thing that gave off the odor the next entry is a few weeks later may 27th it's been here again I find evidence of its presence every day. In the morning, fresh giant footprints were there as before. I, I find it impossible to sleep. This is terrible and terrifying. If this is real, I shall go mad. And if it isn't real, then I'm mad already. It's like I say. Shh, just... June 3rd. I will not leave. I will not let it drive me away. This is my house my land. June 5th. I can't stand it any longer. I've invited Harker to spend a couple of days here with me. He has a level head. I can tell from the way he acts whether or not he thinks I'm insane. Turn it off. I've heard all I intend here. Not yet, sir. We're coming to the most important part of the whole thing. Just listen. June 10th. I have it. I'm sure I have it. I have the solution to this mystery. It came to me last night suddenly. And how simple it is. How how terribly simple. There are sounds we cannot hear. At either end of the scale there are notes that that imperfect instrument the human ear cannot grasp. They're either too high in pitch or too low. Like those whistles that they make for dogs. The dogs can hear it. But the tones are too high for the human ear. And uh, Mr. Hart, listen, please. As it is with sounds, so it must be, so it is with colors. Things that are visible to the eye, things that are not visible, are all of them ruled by the same phenomena that govern sounds. At one end of the solar spectrum, there are infrared waves and ultraviolet waves at the other. None of them are visible to the human eye. The eye can only see a few octaves of this huge band of colors, the band between the infrared and the ultraviolet. Now I know that I am not mad. There are colors that we cannot see. And heaven help me, the damn thing is of such a color. Well... Yes? That's what killed Morgan. I was there. I saw it happen. Mr. Harker, you play this tape for anybody, and they'll swear that Professor Morgan was as crazy as a loon. I don't think you'd want that, would you? What are you going to do? May I please have that real tape? Now... I love the truth as well as the next fellow. The world needs the truth. But there are times when the world has an even greater need for what is not true. For the untruth that may offer something like consolation, compassion, or hope. And so, Mr. Harker, with your permission... I think destroying this tape is the best thing we could possibly do. As the last foot of tape turned into ashes, the skies opened up and it began to rain. And the mutilated body of Hugh Morgan rested quietly where it was. They say, blessed is the bride the sun shines on. Blessed is the corpse the rain falls on. Who knows? I'll be back in a moment. An interesting footnote on Ambrose Bierce, the American writer on whose story, The Damned Thing, our tale was based. In 1913, he left his work, disappeared into Mexico, and every trace of him was lost forever. Never heard from again. Is it just possible that he, like Hugh Morgan, 
met his end at the hands of some damned thing? Who knows? Our cast included Arnold Moss, Robert Dryden, Joan Tompkins, E.V. Juster, and Bob Caliban. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Even tricks go wrong sometimes, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Uh, did anything like that ever happen to your husband? Well, yeah, once. He, he couldn't open the lock on his handcuffs. See, he had a key hidden in the cuff of his trousers, but it slipped out of his hand and fell between the cracks of the floorboard. He wasn't hurt or anything. It was just a wicker basket escape on stage. I see. But if anything like that happened now, I mean, uh, at the bottom of a lake. But that would be terrible. It would be awful. Yeah. It would be really tragic. I, I don't want to think about any such thing. I, I just don't want to think about it. No, no, no. Of course not, Wanda. At least we won't think about it tonight. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Entertainment for the entire family produced right here in Kalamazoo. Join us now for a voyage into another dimension. A journey into a realm as infinite and limitless as time itself. Our destination the farthest reaches of the imagination. WMUK Special Projects presents Future Tales. Now we go forward in time to the days when war has been outlawed and in its place... There is a system of carefully controlled, legalized murder. Our story, The Seventh Victim, by Robert Sheckley. Yeah. Come in, Jerry. Are you anxious, Stan? Well, you know how it is when you're waiting for notification. It's been two weeks. The government's behind schedule as usual. Well, that's the way it always is. You can relax. I picked up the mail just before I came in. Here's your notification. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Look, from the ECB. You're not going to open it now, are you? No, no, no. Of course not. No one is supposed to know the victim's name except the hunter. That's right. Have a good hunt, Stan. You know, you need a kill. You've been all, all keyed up. Yeah, well, it's too bad you have to retire, Jerry. Well, I got into the tens club. Ten hunts, that's not such a bad record. Ten hunts, of course not. Ten hunts, and then, of course, the victims in between. That's 20 kills. <laughs> I sure hope my victim isn't anyone like you. Now, don't worry about it. Hey, what number will this be? My seventh. Oh, lucky seven. Go to it. We'll get you into the tens club yet. By the way, I got a circular in the mail. Maybe you'd like to use it. Victims, why take chances? You as an O'Donovan accredited spotter, let us locate your assigned killer. Pay after you get it. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, but I've got my own spotter. There is the book. What's that? Yeah, sounds like a shooting down the hall. I got somebody got his victim. Good for him, huh? 
Oh, it feels wonderful, Jerry. I feel alive again. <laughs> Hello, Ed. Oh, hi, Mr. Freeline. I'm going out on one, Ed. Well, good luck, Mr. Freeline. I suppose you want me to stand by. Yeah, that's right. I don't expect to be gone more than a week or two. I'll probably get my notification of victim status within three months of the kill. Well, I'll be standing by. Good hunting, Mr. Freeline. You'll be sure to save time for me now, Ed. I'd hate to be caught as a victim without a first-class spotter on my side. Now, don't you worry, Mr. Freeline. I'll be right there in your corner. I've got a couple of good ideas for an ambush I haven't tried yet. Good, good. Well, uh, I'll get back in touch with you right after the kill. So long. Uh, Mr. Freeline? What are you doing in my apartment? Uh, allow me. My card, Emanuel Gale, Emotional Catharsis Bureau, oh, uh, ECB. What do you want from me? Oh, just a standard spot check and reorientation. I see you got your notification. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I haven't opened it yet. You mind? No, no, go right ahead. Anything wrong, Mr. Freeline? I mean, everything's there. Photographs, address, description, data. Yes. But it says Janet Marie. Pat... J- Janet Marie. I... I never killed a female. Is this in order? Well, just a moment while I check my list. Um... <laughs> Yes, that's right. The girl registered with the board under her own free will. The law says she has the same rights and privileges as a man. Could you tell me how many kills she has? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but the only information you're allowed is the victim's legal status and the descriptive data which you've received. Could I draw another? Well, you can refuse the hunt, of course. That's your legal right. But you'll not be allowed another victim until you have served. Oh, women... Always trying to horn in on men's games. Why can't they stay home? It just it just doesn't seem feminine. Uh, look, Gail, uh, do you mind if I start packing? Oh, no, 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 no. Go right ahead. If you like, you can give me the historical checkout while you pack, and I'll just check it off here on my card. Oh, all right. Where do you want me to start? Well, let's see. Uh, question one, I guess. <laughs> uh, when was the Emotional Catharsis Board established? The board was formed at the end of the Fourth World War, or the Sixth... Uh, It depends on if you count the new Argentina war. Well, either count will do. Go ahead. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, Weapons increased in magnitude, efficiency, and exterminating power. Soldiers became accustomed to them, and it looked as if another war would be the war to end all wars. Uh, Would you hand me those shirts, please? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, (laughs) of course. So, uh, uh, this time the peace had to last for all time, but the government recognized the need for violence in a large percentage of mankind. They recognized the validity of competition, love of battle in the face of overwhelming odds, and these, they felt, were admirable traits. So their problem was to arrange a lasting peace that would uh, stop the race from destroying itself without removing responsible traits. I'll just get a toothbrush in New York. Very good. Oh, oh, very good. All right, Mr. Freeline. Now, if you could run down the basic rules. Well, um... Anyone who wants to uh, signs up with the ECB for five legal murders. Then, of course, he has to take his turn a few months later. If he survives, the emotional catharsis board picks the victim's names at random. The hunter is allowed six months to make his kill. uh, Armament? uh, Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. He's allowed to use the standard caliber pistol, and he can wear no armor. The uh, victim is allowed to wear armor... Uh, and is allowed to hire spotters. Very good. Very good. Now, we don't have to go over the penalties for killing or wounding the wrong man. I'm sure you know all that. Oh, it's a beautiful system, isn't it? All the people who want to kill can. (laughs) That's about one-fourth of the population, and those who don't want to don't have to. (laughs) There aren't any big wars anymore, just hundreds of thousands of small ones. All right, Mr. Freeline, you're checked out for orientation. All the same, I I don't exactly like the idea of killing a woman. <laughs> but she did sign up, didn't she? Yes, that's right. Janet Patton of New York. Hmm? Strange, isn't it, Mr. Gale? Each killing is a new excitement. It's, it's something you just don't tire of. Uh, yeah, let's see. Oh, I, I guess that's it. Now a note to the milkman, and that's about all. Well... 
I'll be getting along, Mr. Gale. <laughs> Good hunting, Mr. Freeline. <laughs> Where to, Chief? The uh, Carlton Hotel. Carl, you bet. Uh, just uh, get into town. Isn't that noticeable? <laughs> I've been picking up from the airport for maybe ten years. I can spot an out-of-town killer by the way who carries his suitcase. You, uh, you wouldn't be working as a spotter, would you? Oh, no, no, no. The cab bureau don't like it. Uh, this isn't your first kill, I can tell. Yeah? Yeah. Guys in the first kill get too anxious. They want to drive right up to the victim's address, walk right into an ambush. I'd say maybe you had five, six... Seven? Seven. <laughs> you haven't got too long to go before you get into the tennis club. Ever been hunting? Uh, I, I can't afford it. Uh, look, i tell you what. If you can just drive me around the Chelsea area, uh, I'd just like to look at the streets. <laughs> so that's where your victim hangs out, huh? For sure, sure, be glad. Hey, you, you know what you ought to do, Mac? Hmm? You ought to drop in at the hunting show at the Coliseum. They got everything. Bulletproof vests for victims, hats with bulletproof crowns. I've seen an ad for a Melvin straight shot, ECB approved. Carried a load of 12 shots with a deviation of a thousandth inch per thousand feet. Oh, well, that sounds like a fine gun. Well, yeah, they, they got all kinds of trick things, you know. Chains with four shot magazines, 45 caliber flashlight, all kinds of things. Yeah, those novelties are all right for the first time, but old fashioned ways are the best. Hey, hey, look at that. Somebody got him. Oh, I missed it. Uh, nothing to see now. In about four minutes, the guys from the Department of Sanitation will carry me the cross. Yeah. Well, this is the neighborhood, Chief. You want to give me the address? Uh, no, no. Let's just drive around. Okay. You're paying to meet it. What is it, Chief? There. That uh, sidewalk can't be. Should I stop? No. Just drive slowly. There she is. Sitting at the table. Oh, you mean your victim is a dame? Yeah. She's just sitting there. Is she crazy exposing herself in the open? Oh, boy, that's sure no way to stay healthy. Not when you're a victim. Okay. Drive around the block. Yeah, okay. That's younger than the picture. She looks sad. I wonder if she has been notified. Why, she's got to be notified, Chief. They can't send you your notice until her signed receipt gets back to the office. It's automatic. Yeah, that's right. Isn't she even going to try to defend herself? Well, don't look like it. Hey, here, here come again. She's still there. All I have to do is ride by in a cab and pump a bullet into her. Uh, okay, Chief, I'll, I'll go real slow. Now, you be sure to allow for a motion of the cooler. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, park across the street. Sure. Both her hands are on top of the table. An easy, stationary target. All I've got to do... Hey, 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 remember to roll down the window before you shoot that gun, huh? Ah, that's too easy. No, no, look, mister, hurry it up, will you? If a cop comes along, finds you shooting out of my cab, he'll give me a ticket for double plug. No, 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 it's too easy. All my other six kills have been hard. My victims have tried every dodge. One of them hired a dozen spotters. I got them all. I dressed as a milkman. Hey, <laughs> that's, that's pretty clever. No, nah, this wouldn't be a trophy. Put your flag up. I'm getting up. Okay. I'm going to go over to talk to her. Yeah, she's your victim. Damn it. I know. It's too easy this way. Hey, hello. What? Uh, hey, uh, look... If I'm being fresh, just tell me and I'll go. I'm an out-of-towner here on a convention, and I'd just like to talk to somebody. If you'd rather I didn't, oh, I'll... I, uh... I don't care. May I sit down? My name is Stanton Freeline. I'm Janet. Janet what? Janet Patton. Nice to know you. Are you doing anything tonight, Janet? I'm probably being killed tonight. Oh. Are you a victim? You guessed it. If I were you, I'd get out of the way. No sense getting hit by mistake. Well, you're awfully calm about it. 
Don't you care? Haven't you got any spotters? No. Mr. Feline, I, I'm a bad, bad girl. Hmm? Got the idea I'd like to commit a murder, so I signed for ECB. And I couldn't do it. Oh, I am. Sorry. But I'm still in, of course. Even if I didn't shoot, I, I still have to be a victim. Well, why don't you hire some spotters? I couldn't kill anyone. I, I just couldn't. I, I don't even have a gun. Well, you've got a lot of courage coming out in the open this way. What can I do? You can't hide from a hunter. Not a real one. I don't even have enough money to make a disappearance. Well, since it's your own defense, I, no, I should... No, no, I, I've made up my mind about that. This whole thing is wrong. This whole system. When I had my victim in sight, I could, I could see how easily I could... Well, I could have... Let's forget it. I'm glad you talked to me. At least it'll pass the time. It's been a lovely dinner. Just lovely. Well, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. I usually stop at this little place when I'm in New York. Do you come in often? Oh, on business. I'm in clothing, you know. What do you do? Oh, I'm an actress. Well, that's a laugh. I'm not really an actress. I'd like to be an actress, but none of the producers seem to see it that way. How old are you? I'm 25. I've only been in New York for a year. You know, you're really being very foolish just sitting out in the open that way. Why, well, your hunter could just come along and pump a bullet into you. I know. I know. Somehow I feel safe with you. Oh, uh, say, Janet... Would you like to go to the gladiatorials with me tonight? We've got about 20 minutes. We'd only miss the opening numbers. Oh, I, I suppose so. <laughs> Might as well, huh? Eat, drink, and, and be merry. I'm a little disappointed. Why? I thought the New York gladiatorials would be something special. It's about the same as Cleveland. Isn't there any difference? Well, the duel of the dead, but otherwise it's the same in Cleveland as it is in New York. You know, that's funny. I used to think those gladiatorials were very exciting. <laughs> now they just make me a little sick. Well, you can get tired of the best of shows. You know, frankly, I think it was a mistake starting to televise the gladiatorials. Cut down on the box office, for one thing. And for another, it just isn't the same as being right there in the stadium, you know? No, 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 it isn't. Well, uh, do you want to stay for the second half? Let me see. They've got uh, uh, bull fighting, lion fighting, bow and arrow, and, and dueling on the high wire. No, I, I've had about enough. Shall I take you home? Would you please? Sit down. Uh, I'll fix your drink. Janet. What? You're crying, aren't you? Oh, no. No, not really. It's just the thought that any minute from, from anywhere a, a bullet can come crashing into me. It makes me feel so soft and helpless. You are soft. Oh, Janet. You... You're leaving New York soon? I, I suppose so. The convention is only lasting another day. I'll be sorry to see you go. Send roses to my funeral. Janet. What? Janet, I don't want you to be killed. There's not anything you can do about it, is there? Janet, I love you. Oh, Stan. Please, please, darling... Wait, oh, but you're... you can't... You can't love me. I, I'm a victim. I won't live long enough You to... won't be killed, Janet. Listen to me, Janet, darling. I'm your hunter. Uh, are, are you going to kill me? Don't be ridiculous. Darling, I'm going to marry you. Oh, Stan. Stan, my darling... All the waiting's been so frightening. It's all over. It's all over. <laughs> Think what a story it'll make for our kids. Oh, darling. How I came to murder you and left marrying you. Oh, Stan. <laughs> Kiss me. Oh, uh, 
I think I'd better get a cigarette. Let's start packing. Oh, wait. I want... Wait. You haven't asked if I love you. What? You haven't even admired my cigarette lighter. What are you talking about? It's a lovely lighter, isn't it? With a small hole in the bottom. Just large enough for a thirty-eight caliber bullet. No, no, no. I'm not being funny, darling. Janet. Janet, I I, I love you. I, I told you, I love you. What's the matter with you? I don't love you, Stanton. I am a good actress, aren't I? Even though the producers don't think so. You... You knew all along. Yes, of course. Don't reach for that. Janet! Janet! Yes, darling? (laughs) Well, now I can join the Tens Club. WMUK Special Projects has presented The Seventh Victim. A story by Robert Sheckley, adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Our cast included Tom Small as Freeline, Peg Small as Janet, John Scott as Emmanuel Gale, Mark Spink as the cabbie, Dick Atwell as Ed, and Eric Grandstaff as Jared. Future Tense is produced and directed by Ellie Siegel. Next, on Future Tense. Al! Al! Here I am. Come on back to the house. What's the matter, Dad? Then I'll shut up and run. What is it? The spider's busted loose. A Bert Alstrom radioed in. They coming here? Uh, they're headed this way, the murdering devils. Did they kill anybody? Six patrolmen when they busted through the wires. All right, I'll get inside. What are you going to do, Dad? A wire up. Keg of Adams and A across the gate. Now, you get in there and get the guns out. I got the rifles and shoved a full clip in each one. Then I slipped the primer feeders in the homemade grenades and led them out on the porch. Dad was running lead wires back to the detonator from a half keg of Adams and A he'd set across the gate. There. That's it. Now, give me one of those rifles. Will they be here soon? Well, I, I can see the dust over the rise. Murdering spiders. What'll they do? I don't know. Now make sure you get a good sight, Al. And don't waste any bullets. Here they are, Dad. Here they come. If you are enjoying these future tense programs and would like to hear more drama on WMUK, please let us know. Address your comments as well as suggestions for future programs to Future Tense, WMUK, Western Michigan University, Kalamazoo, Michigan. The zip code is 49001. This is Gerard McLeod inviting you and your entire family to join us every Monday through Thursday at the same time for Future Tense. Be sure to listen. Now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Gangbusters. Tonight, the case of the costume killer, who was an old hand at his trade and a hard master to his apprentices. Until he learned the first lesson of society at the hands of skillful detectives. And now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked Chief J.A. Pitcock, who recently retired as Chief of Police, Little Rock, Arkansas, after 31 years of service... To narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the costume killer. Chief Pitcock, from what you've told me, 
I know tonight's case is so fantastic, the facts about this criminal are hard to believe. Yes, Don Gardner, but I've got his signed confession to murder right here in my hand. Well, when did you first hear of this man, Chief Pitcock? Well, Don, our reports start not too many months ago in the city of Paragold, Arkansas. A tall, slim man about 40 had been sitting in the front parlor of his rooming house. He'd heard a knock at the door, and he was on his way to answer it. All right, all right. Hello, Mr. Osry. Well, come in, come in, Joy. Don't stand there like a tired old field horse. Yes, sir. Look, Mr. Osry, don't be sorry at me because I... Don't tell me here. Come on in the parlor. Yeah. Kids... Spend your days and nights trying to pound a little something in their pumpkin heads so maybe they'll amount to something. Get in there. Yes, sir. Well, what were you going to tell me, boy? Get it out of here. Think you wasn't born with a tongue? I tried, Mr. Us. Be honest, I tried. Sit down. Yes, sir. Now, you got to listen to me, boy. For years, I've been showing kids how to do this. Kids, they all think they're smarter than you. Oh, I don't think I'm smarter than you, honest. Ah, uh, well... If you listened close to me and done exactly like I told you, you wouldn't have had no experience like that. I tried, Mr. Osry. You didn't do it like I told you. You didn't do a thing I told you. Oh, I was awfully scared. That cop came pretty close, awful close. Well, if you'd listened to me and if you'd opened the window like I showed you how to open it, you'd have been in there and out with a stack full of stuff before that cop even got close. Yes, sir, I guess I would, but... But nothing. I got boys all over this city and lots of other cities. I showed them what to do and how to do it. Now, me and you are going back to that store tonight. And me and you are going to come home with a gunny sack full of stuff. Yes, sir. And then after we get that, I'm going to show you a few other things. How to disguise yourself up good so nobody can pick you out. How to pick a lock with just a hairpin. How to break a man's arm with just one twist. Do I have to learn that? Of course you got to learn that, boy. Sometimes you got to hurt people. Sometimes if you don't hurt people, you get hurt yourself. And hurt bad. Did you ever hurt anyone? Only because I had to. Bad? Bad enough. I killed him. Killed him? Uh, only two. Oh. oh. That's what I did my time for. And if I'd killed the third one, I wouldn't done no time at all. But I got soft-hearted. Serves me right. Now, never you get soft-hearted, boy. Oh, no, sir. Now, you listen to me, and I'll tell you how we're going to get in that store tonight. Maybe you ought to use the glass cutter some more. Shh, shh, boy, shh. You got it. Sure, I got it. Okay, Joey, I'll give you a boost up. You unlock the window. Yeah. Now, grab a halt. Okay. Now, up you go. Okay, now. Reach in, unlock the window. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. A little higher. Yeah. Okay, okay, I got it. Good boy. Now, come on down. If you never did it like this last night, we wouldn't have had all this bother tonight. You got your gunny sack? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to boost you in. You know what to take. And when you get it... You meet me back the room. Ain't you coming in with me? There ain't but one way to learn, boy, and that's do it yourself. But, Mr. Osry... Don't stand there arguing with me. Now, come here, I'll boost you. It ain't fair. Now, up you go. Okay, that's enough. Now, jump down. Everything all right? Yeah, I think so. Good boy. I'll see you back the room. All right, all right, I'm coming. Joy? Yeah, it's me. Just a second. Come in, boy. Yes, sir. Well, good work, boy. You did fine. You... Where's the gunny sack? I got it, Mr. Osry. I left it in the shed. Well, I told you to bring it so I could give you what you got coming. I was gonna, but... But, but what, boy? Speak up. There was a cop waiting in front of my house. A cop? It's a good thing I saw him, Mr. Osry, an awful good thing. You snitched, you... Please, Mr. Osry, let go. I didn't have anything to do with it. What's he doing there, then? I don't know, honestly. Let me go. All 
night, boy. If this cop's waiting for you, that ain't good. What do we do? Well, I'll tell you, boy. Uh, you go on home and get to bed. But the cop will That don't me. matter none, boy. You got no record. You get off easy. But I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to. I'll just give you a talking to. With me, it's a sight different. I'm on parole. They send me back to prison for life. You wouldn't want that to happen to your old friend, Slim Usry, would you? Oh, no, sir, I wouldn't. Well, now you see why I got to leave town. Anyway, I got some some of my other boys to look in on. Uh, I'll be in touch with you, boy. You'll hear from me. You're a good boy. So, Don, Slim Usry, a parole murderer and tutor in crime, fled to his native town of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where he sought refuge at the home of his sister Etta. But Slim Osry's sojourn in Hattiesburg didn't prove as pleasant as he had hoped. Slim? Slim? Slim! Yeah, what's ailing you now? I asked you to weed the garden. Instead, you sit there all day like you were the landlord waiting for his rent. If you want the garden, weed it, weed it yourself. I ain't budging, Etta. I ain't budging an inch. Honest, Slim, it just ain't right. If I feel like it, Etta, I'll sit here all week. I don't know how many times I have to tell you, Slim. You ought to be out working like other men. Now, looky here, Ida. If there was work I felt like doing, I'd be out doing it. There ain't no kind of work around this town I feel like doing. Can't you get that through your head? If you don't work, you're blown back in the penitentiary. Now, look here, Ida. I said the penitentiary. Don't you talk to me like that, Ida. The whole town's talking about you. They all know what you are. I got to bear the shame. Who cares? I could see that you're sent back to jail. You shut up, you oh, old pen. Don't, you... don't, don't. Uh, uh, why should I dirty my hands on you? Fine home you give your own brother, always nagging. Don't know when to stop. I guess it was a mistake taking you in. More of a mistake now coming back. I guess you better leave, Slim. I reckon I best. I want you to be packed when I get home. Yeah. What time are you coming back? I won't be back till late tonight. Hey! What? Who's going to fix my supper? Nobody. You're not eating here again. Hey, Edda! You old hen, you ain't sending me back no penitentiary. You ain't even going to think about sending me back. That, Don, was the moment Slim Usry made up his mind to murder his sister Etta. He knew she would walk home that night, and he waited in a clump of weeds until he heard her footsteps. Edda? <gasps> Howdy, Edda. You have a nice time? Oh, Slim, you scared me. Did I, Edda? What were you doing back in those weeds? Did you did you lose something? No. I'm just fixing to lose something, that's all. What do you mean? Nothing, Edda, nothing at all. Are you all packed to go? I... I don't want you in my house tonight. I changed my mind, Dad. I'm staying. Who, who said so? I said so, that's who. No, not in my house. No? If you, if you don't go tonight, I'm calling the police. You call him, Eddie. You call him. S Slim, no, no, you, no, don't. Oh, him. Try to send me back to penitentiary, will you? Find a way to treat a brother. You. <clears throat> you old hen. You treat your brother like a wooden dog. Take care of you. Deputy Sheriff Clarkson. Deputy Clarkson, this is Slim Osry. Yes, Slim. Hi. Uh, it's my sister, Etta, Deputy Clarkson. She, she left the house yesterday to go visiting. She didn't come home all night. Where'd she go, Slim? Well, I don't rightly know, Deputy Clarkson. Uh, but you know, Edda, that ain't like her. Something must have happened to her now. Would, would you help me find her? All right, Slim, I'll be right over. So, Don, the murderer, Slim Usry, reported to the authorities that his sister Etta was missing, although it was Usry himself who killed her. But in carrying out his plan to fool the police, Usry ran into unexpected difficulties. 
Now back to Gangbusters and Chief Pitcock. Now you were telling us, Chief Pitcock, that Slim Usry murdered his sister Etta and then reported her missing. Yes, Don. And an investigation was started. The weeded area of the neighborhood was on the list of places where deputies thought the woman might be found, and the search there was in progress. Deputy Clarkson? Yes, Liz. You don't reckon we find Etta in here? If anything happened, Etta, it'd break my heart. I know how you feel, Slim. Let's cut the talk and look. Okay. Uh, Edda. Matter, Slim. Hey, boys. Come over. Hold it, man. What's the matter? What's the matter? Did you find something, Slim? Uh, good Lord. Edda. Edda. Come away from us, Slim. Come away. I won't sleep a wink till I get the man did this. I won't sleep a wink. Come in. Hello, Deputy Clarkson. Slim. They said you wanted to see me. Yes. Come on over and sit down. Sure, Deputy Clarkson. Well... You got any idea who killed my sis? Yes, Slim. I've got a few ideas. Well, you just tell me who it was. I could wring his neck with my two hands. I could... You could what, Slim? Well, you can't blame me none, Deputy Clarkson. Poor little letter, never did no harm, no one. Murdered in cold blood like that. You killed two men yourself, Slim. Well, that, that, that was different. What was so different about it? Well, I paid for it. I spent 19 years put away, and I... You don't think it was me killed Etta? Well, I didn't say you killed her, but you could have. Well, I didn't. What would I be killing my own sis for? I haven't any idea. This is a fine thing. I come down here to help you, and I, I get accused of murder. Just because I've been in a little trouble once or twice, you, you can't let a man have no peace. Not even when they're fixing to bury his poor sister. Hey, Slim. Huh? Come here. What do you want? How come it was you, out of all the people looking for Edda, that found her body? You seem to know just where it was. Well, she just happened to be where I was looking. If I killed her, you don't think I'd be fool enough to find the body, do you? Slim, I don't know what to think. Well, Don, a few months went by and no new evidence turned up. Then one day Slim Musry left town and went to Little Rock, Arkansas. Shortly after he arrived, Usry walked into a costumer's shop on Commerce Street and asked to look at a wig and mustache outfit he saw in the window. Yes, sir. Finest wig and mustache in Little Rock. There you are. Yeah, not bad. I seem better. I uh, take it you're going to a party? Oh, I figured on a couple of parties. You got a looking glass here? If they look good on, maybe I'll take them. Right in back here, sir? Oh, yeah. The uh, mustache sticks right on. I can see how it works. Very good, very good indeed. Nobody'd recognize you, not with that on. How much? Well, now, let's see. Uh, that'd be, uh, oh, $11.80 with the tax. Okay. Shall I wrap them up for you? Sure, wrap them. You don't think I'm going to wear them now, do you? Attention, all squads. Be on alert for bandit who robbed auto rental agency, Six and Scott, of several hundred dollars in cash. This man, described as tall and slender, apparently wore black mustache and wig as disguise. Caution, this man is armed and dangerous. Oh, come on in, 
Sergeant. What a morning, Captain. I had that witness look at every picture in the file. No luck. Not with that wig and mustache disguise. Good disguise. You know, I can't remember anyone using a disguise like that on a holdup in years. This must be an old-timer. Well, the victim thought he was about 40, Captain. It doesn't make him too much of an old-timer. I wonder if he bought that wig and mustache at one of the shops here in Little Rock. Maybe. But they can't tell whether that stuff came from their shop until they see it. And it looks like we'll have to get our man before they can see it. Hello, Mr. Tussery. Huh? Well, Joey. Sit down, boy. Sit down. Thanks, Mr. Tussery. Uh, call me Slim, Joey. People around here know me as Slim. Okay, Slim. By gravy, you growed. How about a beer, Joey? Oh, no, thanks. Later, maybe. Well, I uh, came as soon as I got your letter. Yeah. Well, I wrote to you, boy, because I like you. And I want to do something for you. I was sure glad to hear you didn't go to that reformatory. Well, it was like you said. They gave me a talking to and let me go. <laughs> they haven't caught me since. That's good boy, Joey. I uh, figured when I got your letter, you uh, needed some help. Uh, not just yet, boy. First, you've got to finish your lessons. Lessons? Well, I could do okay now. I've been doing okay. Well, maybe you could, but we've got to be sure about it. Now, tonight, I'm going to try my old disguise trick again. You recollect I was telling you once about disguises? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, boy, tonight, I got a nice little old cafe all picked out. It'll be so easy, I won't need help from you. I wouldn't need you even if you were ready. So you just stick around my room. Yes, sir. What'll you have? This hey, stick up. What? Reach. What's the matter? Everybody quiet. Wait a minute. Wait I'll... for nothing. I'm in a hurry. Where's the dough? I'll get it. I'll get it. Hey. Hey. It, it, it was an accident. I don't like accidents. Oh. Oh. I don't anybody oh. move till I'm gone. Oh. Anybody follows gets the same. Get him. Get him. Oh, How bad is he, Sergeant? Luckily, not so bad. Both flesh wounds, Captain. This is his room. Okay. Let's go in. Hello, Mr. Walters. How do you feel now? Oh, not... not bad, considering... I'm Captain Crossman. Oh, hello. Mr. Walters... Do you think you could recognize the man who held up your cafe and shot you? I... I, I don't know. Maybe I could. I, I ought to know that mustache anyway. Mm-hmm. Is this the mustache? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I'd swear that's it. It was found in an alley near your cafe. The hold-up man was seen running up that alley. <laughs> that's, that, that's it, all right. Thanks, Mr. Walters. We know where it was bought. Now all we've got to do is find the man who bought it. Now back to gangbusters. I'm telling you, Joey, just like I tell all my boys. If you miss doing something one way, no matter how many times it worked, it ain't good no more. Uh, that seems crazy to me. All you got to do is get another mustache. No, boy, the police and everybody else on that mustache and wig trick. I got to try something else. Yeah, but you promised I could try the mustache trick. I said no, boy. When I say no, I mean it. Maybe we'll pick up and go someplace else and try it, but not here in Little Rock. Ah, oh, it's not slim. And we're just getting set here. Well, I don't know whether I'm going to stay or not. They got a big charge against me. I could have killed that man last night. Oh, the guy was shot up a little. Serves him right. Maybe I should have killed him. Sure. So, he'd have been number three. Uh-uh, Joey. Number four. Number four? You heard me. You mean you killed somebody since I saw you last? What if I did? She want no account. 
And getting back, we got to change our way of operating. We got to just... <coughs> Boy, where are you going? I'm uh, going out for some air. Well, now watch out where you go and what you do. Well, just going out to get you a present. Present, boy? For me? Sure. And uh, one for myself. I'll uh, see you later, Slim. Captain Crossman. This is Sergeant Woods. We've got men planted at that costume store. Nothing doing yet, Captain. Well, keep them there. And at the other stores, too. Okay, Captain, but it's pretty much of a shot in the dark. This fellow'd be a chump to come back for another mustache. Maybe. But if he does come back, I want a welcoming party for him. Joey? Yeah, Slam, open up. Where you been, boy? Get in here. I told you I was going out to buy a present. Is that it there? Uh Uh-huh, that's it. Well, don't stand there, boy. If you're going to give it to me, give it here. (laughs) I got two of them. What is it? Give it here, boy. Ah, not until you promise I can use one. One what? One of these mustache outfits. Mustache outfits? Uh Uh-huh. Where'd you get it? Let go. Please, Slim, let go, will you? Where'd you get it? At the same store you showed me. Please, Slim, you hurt me. Please. I ought to kill you, boy. I ought to beat your brains out. No, please. You could have brought the cops here. You know that. There were no cops. I look good on us. Let go, Slim. Huh? No cops? I'm positive. I didn't see anybody. Uh, well, as long as you didn't see no cops, I guess be no cops coming here, sure, huh? Sure, Everything's okay. Yeah. You didn't listen to me, Joey. I kill people who don't pay no attention. I uh, Slim, don't do nothing. Come here, you, you miserable... Don't go. I didn't mean nothing. Didn't mean nothing, eh? Please. please. Police officers, you're under arrest. Uh, Me? Please, I didn't do nothing. He was trying to kill me. We'll see about that, son. Come on, both of you. Uh, Watch who you're pulling. Come on, you. Okay, kid. Let's go. No, I don't want to go to jail. Come on, boy. It's just another lesson. Uh, It should have been the first lesson. It should have been the first... So, Don, that was the end of the teacher of crime. And Usri, who thought he had committed a perfect murder, made the worst mistake of all. He told someone about it. And the boy Joey told the police. In the Little Rock jail, William Usri confessed the murder of his sister, Etta. Usri was returned to Mississippi, where he died in the electric chair in the Forest County Jail a few months ago. Well, congratulations, Chief Pitcock, to you and to the men of the Little Rock Police Department who solved this terrible crime. (laughs) Principal roles in tonight's dramatization were played by Bill Smith and Jack Grimes. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. Now, the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio drama dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden. Down to the depth with a veil of time is lifted, and the supernatural reigns in peace. Come with me and listen to the tale of He Who Follows Me. The Death That Walks? Well, how did he come to get that name? Because people around here have seen him at night. But he's dead. That's right, he's dead. And they've seen him walking. Ah, this must be their imagination. It ain't their imaginations, I know. I've seen him myself. What are you trying to do? Frighten us? I ain't trying to frighten you, none. <laughs> I don't have to. He'll frighten you. Old Mr. Tynus. The death that walks. 
because he'll come for you. <laughs> he'll come for you. In just a moment, the Hall of Fantasy will present He Who Follows Me. And now for our story. Adapted for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled He Who Follows Me. I have before me the diary of a dead man. He and his wife were my best friends. The words he's written down tell a tale so fantastic it's almost impossible to believe. Yet I know that Bill and Helen Mason lived the last few months of their lives in dread fear of the slow steps that followed them. It is late evening as I read his words. I have come to their house now so empty and sit in the large overstuffed leather chair in the library. Outside, rain pummels against the side of the house. The wind blows the fall leaves from the trees and the sound of thunder gives vent to the anger of the storm. There's something in the house. A tension. A fear, perhaps. I feel almost as if unseen eyes were watching me. As if someone is here with me. Here in this room. And so I start to read his diary. Living words from the pen of a man who sleeps forever. March 3rd. Today, Helen and I came across one of those delightful old southern mansions. We decided to stop and make a study of the place. And Helen was especially interested in taking some color pictures to illustrate our lecture series in the fall. Well, I guess no one will mind if we take a look around the place. No, I'm sure they wouldn't. Oh, it's a shame that whoever owns the house and grounds let the place run down this way. It must have been beautiful in its day. Yeah, I imagine it was, Helen. Well, the house could still be saved, renovated. Beautiful place. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I- I'd like to get a shot from here. Hmm. Ah, if that turns out, it'll make a nice picture. Helen? Mm-hmm? I wonder what that building is over there. Yeah. Right over there, just in back of the house. Oh, well, no one's to stop us. Why don't we take a look? All right, let's do. Can't understand why anyone would let the grounds and house deteriorate so. Well, it must have cost a lot of money to run a place as large as this, darling. The real estate office probably couldn't find a buyer. Uh, you're probably right. I notice the other building doesn't seem to be so run down. No. It's in remarkably fine condition. It must have been built a lot later than the house. It seems to be made of stone. Gray stone. I wonder what it's used for. I don't know. Actually, I believe that someone lived in the old house not too long ago. And I think probably the second building was constructed during that time. Well, it's a crime to let a beautiful old place run down like this. Mm. Well, here we are. Bill? Yes, dear? It doesn't have any windows. Yes, I noticed that. Seems rather strange. Oh, well, maybe it was used for a store. Oh, look at the door. What's the matter with it? I think the lock's broken. Yeah, you're right. Why don't we take a look inside? All right. Yeah, the lock's all rusted through. There. Yeah, that does it. And now to see what's inside. <laughs> Well, there might not be any windows, but there's a skylight that lets in the sun. Come on, let's go in. All right. Ooh, it's so, so cold in here. Uh, so I noticed. Helen, what's that in the center of the floor? <laughs> That's just what I was going to say. This isn't a storehouse by any stretch of the imagination. It's a mausoleum. That thing in the center of the floor is a sarcophagus. Stone coffin. There's nothing else in here. Just that... That thing in the center. And yet I feel as if... It's crowded. As if there are things here that we can't see. (laughs) That's nonsense, darling. Hey, look, notice how the sun falls across the head of the sarcophagus. Yes, I wonder if we have light enough to take a picture. I doubt it, but you could try. I might as well if it turns out... What are you two doing in here? We noticed the lock was broken, and so we came on in. You shouldn't have done that. Why not? We didn't do any harm. I'm sure of that, but he won't like it. Who won't like it? The thing that sleeps in that stone coffin. What are you talking about? Just what I said. You didn't notice the writing over the door when you came in, did you? What writing? You didn't notice it then. That's a shame. 
Because you didn't know what you was getting into. Getting into? Look, I'm sorry, but I just don't understand. We didn't hurt anything. We're not intending to steal anything. But that don't make no difference. He doesn't care what your reasons were. Who is he? They called him Mr. Thomas when he was living. They call him the death that walks now that he's dead. The death that walks? How did he come to get that name? Because people around here have seen him at night. But he's dead. That's right, he's dead. And they've seen him walking. That must be their imagination. It ain't their imaginations, I know. I've seen them myself. What are you trying to do? Frighten us? I ain't trying to frighten you none. <laughs> I don't have to. He'll frighten you. Oh, Mr. Thomas. The death that walks. I uh, think we'd better go, Bill. You don't believe what I'm telling you. That's all right with me. I don't care what you believe. But you listen to what I'm saying now. If I was you, I'd get away from here as fast as I could. Not just from this place, but from the town. From this part of the country. Why? You want me to tell you a little of the story? Yes. All right. Maybe you'll believe me then. Old Tannis came here from someplace in Europe. I say old, but he really wasn't old. Just seemed that way. He brought the house and grounds here and had them clean up. Till the place looked like it was brand new. Then he started building this here building. There's something funny about Tana, something in his eyes that, that made you frightened of him. His eyes, they looked like the eyes of a, of a dead man. He didn't act like anyone I ever knew. He was always talking about dead. Always telling me he could come back after death. I was the caretaker then, just like I am now. After this building was completed, I used to watch him at night when he'd come out here. Seemed like he was in some sort of a trance. He'd stay out here for hours. And when he'd come back to the house, his, his eyes would glisten and shine so you couldn't hardly look at him. A week before he died, he told me that as long as I lived, I was to take care of this place. Because if I didn't, he, he'd come back and kill me. And then he died. Just like that. And he was put in here, in his coffin. One night, about two months later, when the moon was full, I heard a noise. When I come out to look, I saw the door to this place opening and him come out in the moonlight. I could hear his footsteps. It sounded queer and hollow-like. I turned around and I could see his face in the moonlight, pale and pasty, sick-looking, and those eyes of his seemed like two burning coals of fire. He seemed to be looking at me. And I heard him say, They have disturbed me, and the moon has awakened me. I shall follow them. That's what he said. And I heard it just as plain as you're hearing me. And then he vanished in the night. And towards morning, I heard him. Footsteps again. And I heard that big iron door closing. And I knew he was back. The next day in town, I heard that Alf Cummins had died the night before, screaming something about not meaning to go into the mausoleum. I knew who killed him. And that's all there is to the story? Oh, that's just part of it. It's happened again and again in the last ten years since he's been dead. Folks around here say he'll follow you wherever you go if you come inside here. Well, in that case, why haven't you been killed? Because he needs me. <laughs> he ain't going to kill me. But if I was you, I, I'd get out of this part of the country just as soon as I could. Let's go back to the hotel, Bill. Yeah, that's all I do. You going to get away from here? Yes, we'd better get going. Yeah, I wish I'd have been here when you come, but I was in town getting this lock. You can't go around leaving this door unlocked. Yeah. That ought to satisfy him. There's the inscription, Bill. Yes. Yeah, that's the writing I mean. Got a nice sentiment, ain't it? If you enter here, into the realm of death, I shall follow you. And bring him with me. March 3rd, later. I sit here and write these words. It 
It's quite late and the moon has risen full in the sky. Helen is standing by the window looking out. For some reason, I am frightened. And yet I know that a few months from now I shall only laugh at the memory of my fright. However, in the morning, I do believe that we will leave this place. All true? Yes, for tonight at least. I think we'll be leaving tomorrow, Helen. Oh, I'm glad. I don't believe the caretaker story, and yet I'm afraid. Yeah. It's a beautiful night. Yes, isn't it? That moon's so big and full that it could... Bill. Yes, dear? Look down there at the street. There's a man down there. Oh, there's nothing to be... Bill! He's looking straight up at us and pointing to us at... Look at his face, Bill. Look at his face. Pale. Pasty looking. And his eyes... Like two burning coals of fire. Back now to our story. Adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne. Entitled, He Who Follows Me. As I read these pages, the words tear up at me. And their formations bring to life a nameless terror which I feel all around me. Outside, the storm still rages. Yet the sound of it fades from my mind as the terror in the pages of the volume I hold before me becomes increasingly apparent. March 3rd. Still later. The man down in the street, whomever he was, left after about ten minutes. He has given us quite a fright. Where have I felt any doubts as to whether or not we should leave this place? They've all been dispelled now. Helen has just gone to bed. I think I shall do the same. If we're going to leave in the morning, you'd better get to sleep, Bill. I want to get out of here as soon as I can. Yes, I was just coming to bed, Helen. That man we saw... Yes? It might be only coincidence. Do you really believe that, Helen? Are you trying to talk yourself into it? I guess I'm trying to rationalize it. I'm afraid I'm not doing a very good job of it. Uh, I don't know what to believe. It could be coincidence, but... somehow I'm afraid it isn't. Then you think that... Maybe. No, don't worry about it, Helen. By tomorrow, we'll be several hundred miles from here. And I doubt if whomever it was will follow us. They sound just like the steps the caretaker described to us. Yes, but we saw him walk away. I think Billy's in the room upstairs. Well, it's probably someone else. No, I know it's not. All right, all right. Just a minute, I'll call the desk. This is William Mason in 316. Can you tell me who has the room directly above mine? Clerk's going to check. Yes? Oh, I see. No, no, thank you very much. What did the clerk say? The room directly above ours is unoccupied. March 4th. We left the hotel a short time after we heard the steps. We went immediately to our car and drove all night and all day. And are stopping now in a motel almost a thousand miles away. It's reassuring to know that he could not possibly follow us. I am very tired. We'll go to bed and get an early start in the morning. Helen? You asleep? No. What are you thinking about? The words that were written above the mausoleum door. If you enter here into the realm of death, I shall follow you and bring him with me. Phil? Yes. Yes, I hear them too. He couldn't possibly have come this far, could he? I don't know. What's the matter? It's our face. Pressed against the window. It's not there now. I was there for just a few seconds. I saw a bill. The same man we saw last night outside the hotel. He was right outside the window. <laughs> Uh, 
March 5th. This morning when I went in to pay the bill, the man who owns the motel said a strange, pasty-faced man had been in earlier and told him to tell me that he would follow me. March 11th. It's impossible to get any material together that'll help me in my work. Everywhere we go, he's there also. Yeah, Mr. Mason, this guy said it was all right for you to go on ahead because he was going to follow you. March 22nd. No, he didn't leave a name. He just said that he'd be in touch with you. April 7th. Never saw anyone who looked like that before. See a friend of yours, Mr. Mason? April 18th. He said he'd follow you. Twenty nine. Told me to say he'd follow you. May 15th. Follow you. 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 I can't stand it. I can't stand it. <laughs> I, I wish there was something I could do, Helen, but there's nothing. I've done my best, Wilson, but I can't. If we go home, it'll be the same thing. Maybe. Maybe it won't. I can't stand this anymore. All right, all right, darling. We'll leave for home right away. June 23rd. We arrived home this evening. I called Gary as soon as I could. He said he'd be out within the hour to see us. wasn't able to help us in any way. I really didn't expect any help. I was hoping that he might be able to offer some concrete suggestion as to what to do. However, last night was the first night in months that we haven't been aware of his presence. Maybe, maybe Helen is right. Perhaps he won't follow us here. Back now to our story. Adapted especially for radio by Richard Thorne, entitled, He Who Follows Me. July 3rd. We've not seen or heard anything unusual since we first came home. I feel as a man might feel who has been given a new lease on life. July 10th. Still nothing. August 19th. For the past two months, a feeling of peace and security has enveloped the house. Helen and I have been able to go around with no sense of danger nor of dread. But last night, that feeling was shattered. Gary had come out for dinner. It was almost 10 o'clock. Well, it's about time for me to get along. Oh, it's only 10, Gary. Surely you don't have to go so soon. I'm afraid I must, Helen. Tomorrow's a working day for me. I thought I might be able to get you into a game of chess. Oh, some other time, Bill. (laughs) Well, next time, don't stay away so long. Don't worry. I think we ought to... Tell me, is someone upstairs? No. Well, listen. (gasps) He's back. Who's back? The man we told you about. Those are his footsteps. I'd know them anywhere. I should. I've heard them enough. What are you going to do? Look, will you come upstairs with me, Gary? Yes, of course. You stay here, Helen. Don't go up there, Bill. Don't let him, Gary. No, Helen. This time I'm going to meet him face to face. Then I'm going with you. No, you're not. You're going to stay right here. Ready, Gary? Yes. Okay, let's go. Be careful. As careful as we can. If he is up there, what are you going to do? I don't know. We'll find that out when the time comes. Our steps came from the guest room. I don't hear anything. Well, let's see if he's in there. Stand back, Gary. I'm going to open the door. Right. It's empty. There's no one in here. But I heard someone up here. Yes, he was here, but he's gone. I can feel it when he's near me. I know that... Come on. Helen! Helen, where are you? Helen! There she is. In the front room. Helen... What's the matter, Helen? Helen, answer me. She can't, Bill. She's sitting there with her eyes wide open. She's dead.
August 23rd. We buried her today. As I sit here in the empty house writing this, I know that Thomas will come for me too. I am writing this in the hope that someone will find it, read it, and maybe understand my death. It's lonely here, yet suddenly I have the feeling that I'm not alone. Someone is here with me. He is here, in this room with me. I'm afraid to turn and meet him. To have those eyes of his burning into me. And yet, yet I must. I pray that someone reads this. Perhaps he will... He will... third entry was the last he ever made. The feeling of creeping horror that runs through the pages has imparted itself to me. And I sense that someone is here with me. Of course, I realize that it's only my imagination. But I can't shake that feeling. There is someone here. Who... Who are you? Who do you think I am? No one's tonight tale of the unusual, the terrifying, the unknown. Join us again when next we journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to hear another strange tale of the supernatural. All characters and events portrayed in these programs are fictional, and any similarity to actual events or persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Presenting Orson Welles as the third man. The Lives of Harry Lyme. The fabulous stories of the immortal character originally created in the motion picture The Third Man. With zither music by Anton Karras. That was the shot that killed Harry Lyme. He died in a sewer beneath Vienna. As those of you know who saw the movie, The Third Man. Yes, that was the end of Harry Lyme. But it was not the beginning. Harry Lyme had many lives. And I can recount all of them. How do I know? It's very simple. Because my name is Harry Lyme.
And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man in See Naples and Live. Once upon a time, there was an exquisite and huge emerald locket which spent most of its life looking out of the world from the rather fleshy neck of a Mrs. Donaldson as she waddled like a golden duck across the international social horizon. I had a rather strong desire to change the habitat of this particular locket from the neck of this particular lady to my own particular itching palm. It was Naples before the war. Enter. Ah, you kept me impatient for an hour, Mr. Lyme. I'm sorry, Senor Rubio. I just flew in from London, forgot to move my watch ahead. It is my knowledge that you have been in Naples for three days now, but it does not matter. I am a man with a skill for waiting. I'm going to be very brief. I won't waste any more of your time, old Bueno, man. bueno. At first, I must tell you that I've made all the arrangements to dispose of the Donaldson Emerald. Oh, yes? As soon as we uh, possess it, of uh, course. There's a small item I forgot to tell you about, Senor Rubio. I have decided to include you out. I, I do not think I understand. To be brief and simple, I've decided to dissolve our partnership, old man. Oh, you're disposing of me? Perhaps that's a nicer way of saying it. I do not prefer to be disposed. Naturally, you don't, but sometimes we get disposed whether we like it or not. Mr. Lyme, we began this enterprise together, and I think we shall finish it together. You have never been more in error, old man. Now, you must forgive me for running off my... A moment, Mr. Lyme. Yes? You recall Carlos... I do. And that young man from Innsbruck, I forget his name. You mean Manhammer? Yes, if it were possible, they would be very sorry they were rude to me. Hmm. I'm now the most well-threatened man in Europe, and you have joined an innumerable caravan. Arrivederci. Don't oh, farewell me yet, Mr. Lyon. Sorry, but I really must. Do not force me to shoot you. <laughs> if you take one more step toward the door, I will uh, fire. Now, don't be a complete fool, old man. If, if they found a dead man in your room, they'd hang you. I will be easy with you. Just tell me where Mrs. Donaldson is, and I, I will forgive you your ungratefulness. Rubio, I'm on my way out. If you fire that gun, the police will be here before you can get out of the hotel. Buongiorno. There's a saying in this city, see Naples and die. It only proves that life is very short and uncertain for us all. Goodbye, old man. Believe me, I am not a professional hero. But I was not at all concerned about Signor Rubio putting a bullet in me, not in his hotel room. I hurried to the pier where the Arcturus was about to dock. She was carrying precious freight, Mrs. Donaldson. I already made arrangements for one of the customs officials to hold Mrs. Donaldson up on a pretext of going through her luggage. A few thousand liras did the trick. Oh, you stubborn man. I tell you, there's nothing contraband in my luggage. You've already gone through my clothes twice with your dirty hands, Amy. Talk to this man. He doesn't understand a word of English. My Italian is worse than his English. Per increase tanto, signora, ma è necessario. Ho istruzione di esaminare il vostro bagaglio. Deve aver pazienza. What seems to be the trouble here? Thank heavens, an American. I have no idea why this idiotic official is rummaging through my clothes. That's just a matter of form, you know. You would think I was a smuggler or something. I've been to Naples many times, and there's never been this ridiculous fuss. I'll talk to the American consul. See to it that this man loses his job. I wonder if you could talk to him. That is, if you could speak Italian. Well, of course, I'd be only too happy to. Let me see what I can do. Che cosa succede qui? È di regola di esaminare ogni 25 passaggeri. Oh, no, questo non è necessario, conosco il signore. Questa è la mia carta. Ah, signore, mi rincresce tanto di aver dato la signora tutto questo disturbo. No, no, veramente. Niente. It's all right now, you're cleared. Here, let me help your bags, hmm? Thank you ever so much. I don't know what I would have done without you. Amy, get one of those porters to help us with the luggage. Yes, Mrs. Donald. I have my car here. I'd be glad to give you a lift to your hotel. Oh, okay. I wouldn't want you to bother. Oh, don't bother at all, one fellow American to another, you know. Thank you. <laughs> These taxi drivers rob you mercilessly. Uh, oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. My name is Lyme. Harold Lyme. I'm Mrs. Frederica Donaldson. Mrs. Frederica I'm so Donaldson. glad we ran into you. A uh, wonderful piece of luck. <laughs> well, let's say we're well met. <laughs> 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 Loveliness was gracing my car. Loveliness in the form of the emerald locket around Mrs. Donaldson's neck, and loveliness in the form of Amy Collins. She was Mrs. Donaldson's hired companion. She had red hair and eyes to match the emerald, and she liked me. I think she liked me. Every so often I'd catch her eye. And she'd turn away, as if she were guilty of something. Really, Mr. Lamb, I've never been so humiliated. 
Just standing there with that man poking away at my underthings, messing up all my clothes. Absolutely no regard for our feelings. Something should be done about this. He was only following instructions. I don't think he was meant... doing anything of the sort. He was just being malicious and perverse. If it weren't for Mr. Lyon, I don't know what would have happened. We're deeply indebted to him. Oh, you don't owe me anything at all. I did what any other American would have done, Mrs. Donaldson. I wish we could repay you for your kindness. Well, you know, I, I think maybe you can. Wonderful. Just tell us what it is. Well, I've got to buy my sister a gift. It's her birthday. I don't know too much about jewelry, so I wonder if either of you could come along and help me shop. Of course we can. Amy does most of my shopping for me. She's very good oh, at it. That's wonderful. I'm sure she'd be delighted to help you. Don't you want me to help you get your things unpacked? I'm already unpacked, thanks to that customs official. No, you go ahead. Just drop me at the hotel. You don't mind, do you, Miss Collins? Oh, no, not at all. Good. It's a relief. Now, I'd like both of you to be my guests at dinner tonight. That's very kind of you. We'd be delighted. Oh, it's my pleasure, Mrs. Donaldson. Really, it's my pleasure. We deposited fat Mrs. Donaldson in her room, and then Amy and I went shopping. I took her along to the Corso Vittorio Manuele, one of Naples' better thoroughfares. What are you looking for, Mr. Lyme? Please, call me Harry. All right. May I call you Amy? If you wish. Hmm. <laughs> you don't sound very enthusiastic. Please call me Amy. <laughs> That's much better. What do you want to buy for your sister? Some nice jewelry, a necklace or a locket, something like that. Mrs. Donaldson was wearing something pretty, something like that. <laughs> you don't know much about jewelry, do you? Well, I know what I like. Most of the time, the things I like, you can find in a dime store. You won't find Mrs. Donaldson's locket in a dime store. It costs about $20,000. 20000 You're kidding. No, that's a real emerald she has set in the locket. Well, she must be crazy traveling with a thing like that flashing on her neck. Really. Oh, well, it's not very wise, but she's very sentimental about it. Her husband gave it to her just before he died. She swore to wear it every day of her life. She was very devoted to him. Well, I suppose you think I'm pretty much of a chump about jewelry. You have good taste. I also have good luck meeting you. Life is very strange, isn't it? Mm. No, why? Well, just half an hour ago, you and I were total strangers. Now here I am helping you buy a gift as if, as if we'd known each other for a long time. Well, there's nothing wrong in that, is there? No, it's... Just at the moment you entered the scene, things seemed to move fast and efficiently. You make it sound as if it were a force. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. I can go away and come back again and do it more slowly. I suppose I sound foolish. Perhaps it's because you liked me too soon. Well, I... I... Well, I, I liked you too soon. Well... That's probably too fast for you, too. But you see, I'm a man who says what's on his mind. Probably not a very efficient way of talking to a gentle soul like you. Oh, no, I prefer straightforward people. All right, now, you be straightforward. What was your first reaction to me when you first saw me? I, I was interested, perhaps maybe intrigued. That's better. You have a way of condensing relationships quickly. Well, if people like each other, they don't need a calendar full of time to tell them about it. Good things grow slowly. Here's a shop. Hmm. Hmm. Well, they all look pretty. That, that filigree pin... I like that. It's very nice. Which one? Uh, the one near the large cameo. Oh, yes, it is very pretty. Shall we go in? Wait. Let's look at the other things in the window. Ah, I'm begging your pardon. I heard you conversing English. We were talking American, a totally different language. I I'm trying to reach Via Salvatore Rosa. Could you inform me how to get there? Sure, old man. Turn right the next corner and go straight for three squares. Ah, I'm much grateful. That's right, all right. Would you like to... Uh, you like a cigarette? Uh, no, no, thank you very much. Just turn right at the next corner. Oh, I'm unhappy to trouble you further, no, but that's, uh, uh, do you have a match? I'm sorry, but I don't have any matches with me. I have a light. Mademoiselle is most generous. Hmm, a thousand thanks. Uh, turn right at the next corner. And three squares and down, And three eh? squares down. Good day that's to you all. Good Perhaps day. you will meet again, eh? Good day. He seemed most reluctant to leave. Yeah. Uh, an odd fellow. Why did you refuse to give him a light? I didn't like his face. Did you ever see him before? Why do you ask that? We acted as if he knew you. Well, I didn't care to know him. I think you gave him the wrong direction. Well, it could be. It seems that if he followed your directions, he would find himself in the Bay of Naples. I'm sure it won't dampen his spirits. Should we go in now? Yes, of course. There's just one thing I'd like to ask I'll you. I'll answer anything you want. What do you do for a living? Uh, uh, for a living? Oh, I'm a dealer in objet d'art. I wander through the world, collecting the best things. It sounds very interesting. Mm, it is. It's, it's often quite exciting. Now, let's go in and buy that filigree pin. Or 
Orson Welles returns in just a moment as the third man. And now, Orson Welles as Harry Lyme, the third man in See Naples and Live. I bought a pin for 2,500 lira. On the way back to Amy's hotel, she was thoughtful and not much inclined to do any talking. I took her by the hand. She didn't object to that, but she didn't react to the touch. Put it simply, she just let me hold her hand, nothing more. I suspected that Signor Rubio had made too strong an impression. It was essential now that I work fast. The emerald would have to be in my pocket tonight or not at all. However, I wasn't worried about Rubio. Strangely enough, it was Amy that bothered me. I was beginning to be a little too fond of her. That, that was bad. I always make it a point not to be too fond of anyone in this world. This is a lovely romantic restaurant. Well, I'm glad How you did like you it. How you it, Mr. Lyon? You just ask the porter in the hotel. They know everything in Italy. The portiers are the best informed people in the country. It's simply delightful. Oh, God. Don't you think so, Amy? Yes, I do. It's charming. Won't you have some more spumante? Well, just a drop. Ooh, I declare, it's just like champagne. Yes, it's the Italian version. It's so kind of you to give so much time to us, Mr. Lyon. Really, it is. Amy, isn't Mr. Lyon just a dear? I think he's most generous. Oh. I'm having such a delicious time. I feel so happy. Happier than I've been since... I, I wish poor Benjamin were here with us. You would have liked him, Mr. Lyon. Oh, I'm sure I would. Uh, poor Benjamin. Oh, no, 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 Mrs. Donaldson. Let's not be sad here. Just have a little more spumante. Oh, hmm? I really don't think we should. I'm afraid you're going to make us all drunk, Mr. Lyon. Oh, Amy. I don't think another drop will hurt us. After all... Now, this time, Mrs. Donaldson is becoming thoroughly relaxed. Spumante is a fine relaxer. I stirred the champagne with a wooden swizzle stick, the bottom of which was well laced with phenobarbital. My keynote for the evening, as you can see, was relaxation. Before the evening was over, my emeralded guest was going to be the most relaxed woman in all Italy. The spumante bubbled and frothed over as I stirred it. I know I shouldn't have another glass, but... Perhaps you had better stop, Mrs. Donaldson. Never. I just feel so wonderful. How about you, Amy? All right. A toast to us. May we always be as happy as we are now. A toast to you, Mr. Lyon. You wonderful, wonderful man. I patted her neck. I wanted her to get used to the touch of my hand against her neck. She withdrew a little. But her neck had become super sensitive about the locket. So we drank, I studied the clasp on the locket. It was a simple device. You turned a tiny wheel, and it released the catch. Just a twist of the wrist. The musicians are going to play again. Uh, come here, come here. Please, Mr. Lyme, no more spumante. No, I have a special surprise. Yes, senor. Have the musicians come over here. Yes, senor. Oh, isn't that sweet? That's a lovely gesture, Harry. I thought you'd forgotten my first name. Here they are, senor. What would you like them to play? Well, what would you like, Mrs. Donaldson? Oh, I can't think of a thing. How about some Neapolitan songs? Uh, per favore, a monastero Santa Chiara. Canta per It was going to be very easy. They were completely at ease and they trusted me. Amy stole her hand at the mine as they played. It was really quite pleasant. I leaned back and relaxed. That was just beautiful. Very good. Thank you. Molto grazie. Here's something for the lads. Oh, grazie, signor. Did you enjoy it, Mrs. Donaldson? They played divine. I have a wonderful idea. How would you all like to go for a drive to Pompeii? At this hour? Yes, yeah, only 10 o'clock. It's a full moon. It'd be quite a thrill. I adore to go. Fascinating place. I've been there many times. Well, you have to see it at night. That's Isn't it closed? Time. Of course it is. We can go in through the back way near the arena. I'm willing if Mrs. Donaldson is. Try and stop me. What a marvelous idea. It's just one thing. What is it? Amy told me about your emerald locket. I think it'd be safer if you left it at your hotel. In the safe at the hotel. Don't you worry about it. I never take it off no, my really. neck. Except when I retire. 
Don't worry about it. It's perfectly safe. Besides, we won't find any criminals in Pompeii. No, I'm sure not. But all the same, I'd feel better if you left the lock. Oh, no, no, I can't do that. Please don't fret about it. All right, if you're sure. Let's go right now. Just let me pay the bill. Camillere? Yes, signore. Conto, per favore. Check. Yes, signore. It was less than an hour's ride to the ancient, extinct city of Pompeii, lying like a corpse at the foot of its killer, Vesuvius. We entered through the gardens of an ancient home. The moon shone down hard and white, lighting up the empty city. Isn't it thrilling and beautiful and frightening? A chap by the name of Trebio Valenti used to live here. He hasn't been home for nearly 2,000 years. Here we are in Abodanza Street. It's in perfect condition. Isn't it exciting? It's unbelievable. Now look at the gutter. You can see where the chariot wheels made deep ruts in the stone. What a narrow street. We can walk in the gutter. I don't think we'll be run over by any chariots tonight. Where does this street lead to? To the Forum. What about those lovely buildings? Well, they're old mansions. Belong to a couple of rich fellows. See the sign on the wall? What does it say? Post no bills in Latin. <laughs> and the sign alongside of it? Down with such and such a tyrant. Time has worn away the name. It's just amazing. It's all beginning to make me feel faint. Now, don't you feel well, Mrs. Donaldson? I, I feel fine. Uh, just sleepy. I don't know why I should feel sleepy when I'm so excited. Well, don't you want to sit down? Maybe I'd better. Well, just rest for a moment. I think we'd better go back. We will, but first we'll let Mrs. Donaldson catch a few minutes rest. There's a marble bench in the atrium of the Casa de Ceriale. He used to be an arrogant, rich man who didn't like the strangers visiting his palatial home, but I don't think you mind now. Oh, it's lovely in here. Here we are. You sit down, Mrs. Donaldson, and rest your shoulder against mine. There you are. You're a darling, Mr. Lyme. Amy, if you walk into the other room to your right, you'll see some excellent frescoes. They're beautifully preserved. May I have the flashlight? Yes, here, here. Mrs. Donaldson was sleeping softly. I pressed my fingers against her neck to test her responses. There was no reaction. I tried it again so that even in her sleep she would feel no alarm, become accustomed to the feel of fingers around her throat. She slept peacefully on. I quickly unloosed the catch in a slow care, not to slide the locket, picked it. Gently off her neck. At the same time, I held her hand to divert his sensation of touch. It was done quickly. I was ready to make my silent departure, gently propped her against a pillar. Then I heard a sound that froze me footsteps. Footsteps, and they went Amy's. Who's there? Oh, what's the matter? I caught a glimpse of him. It was one of the guards. There was only one thing to do run. Strada Stabione, I turned the corner and ran into one of the old Roman baths. I made for one of the rooms, expecting it to have another exit. It was dark, and I fumbled around. I had a very unpleasant feeling when I became aware that the only way out was the way I came in. I ran back. It's too late. My pursuer was standing at the entrance of the flashlight in one hand and the gun in the other. It was not a guard. It was a ruby. You see, Harry, fate has thrown us together again. <sighs> it's still around her neck. The locket, please. I just told you. It's I'm still... not in my hotel now. This time I will kill you. Give me the locket. I... I'm not a usually reckless fellow, but this time I did a very rash thing. I rushed him. He fired. The bullet tore a hole in my shoulder, barely touching my skin. I wrestled with him. He fell on the marble floor. His wire in very strong. In a few seconds, it was clear that he was in far better shape than I. Then he hit me a very rude blow on the head with a gun. And I abandoned the fight. For a moment, I just lay there thinking... Thinking what a very evil moment of my life this was. Now, the locket. Okay. Thank you. And now I think I will dispose of you for having caused me all this trouble. Halt! Arrivederci! Check the revolver, signore, altrimenti tiro. That's the police, Ruby, old man. You're Sorry. caught. Momento. Caught red-handed. Come oh, But the emerald... It doesn't belong to you, old man. Better go along quietly with the police. Corpo Look, there's some more of them coming through the door. No use putting up a fight. Remember what I've always told you, old man. Crime doesn't pay. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Lang. Risking your life to save my locket. Oh, that's all right. You're the most brave man to chase after him in the dark, unarmed. Well, I just gone to see where Amy was, and I heard the sound. There he was, deftly removing the locket from your neck. I felt someone puttering around my neck, but I thought it was you. Oh, really? I, I was asleep, you know. <laughs> now, I had my suspicions about this Rubio from the first. Does the wound hurt much? Oh, it's nothing. It's a hole in my suit. And a bad bump on your head, you poor boy. Mm -hmm. It'll heal. Amy... 
You haven't said a word to our hero since they arrested that Rubio man. Oh, I'm, I'm just stunned. Oh, I'm sorry we got you into this. I, I never should have taken you to Pompeii. It's all my fault. Of course not. That terrible man would have tried to snatch the locket wherever I was. It's just a lucky thing I met up with you. I'm going to give you a gift. You just must take it. A hundred pound note. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. So You'd make me you very it. happy if you took it. Oh, no, I absolutely... Please, I Mr. Lyme, please. Well, if it means so much to you, I'll Splendid. give it to my favorite charity, yes. Well, here we are at the hotel, safe and sound. Thanks to you. I must run upstairs. The whole thing has given me a severe headache. You will call me in the morning, won't you, Mr. Lyme? Indeed, I will, Mrs. Donaldson. Good night. Good night. Oh, Amy, can I have a word with you? I'll be up in a moment, Mrs. Donaldson. Of course, dear. Good night again. And bless you, Mr. Lyme. I'm... I'm sorry about this evening, Amy. So am I. Let's meet for lunch tomorrow. No, Harry. Why not? I never saw the frescoes on the wall. You didn't? No, I didn't find them, and I walked all the way around. I saw you from the front entrance. Oh. Besides, a man who deals in fine arts would know an emerald locket from a dime store trinket. Yes. Should have thought of that. I was beginning to like you very much, Harry. Well, I'm sorry I'm not the kind of man you'd like to begin to like a little more. It's a pity. You want to see me again, ever? It'll never be any good. Well, you might as well have the filigree pin. What about your sister? I haven't spoken to my sister in ten years. She doesn't approve of me. Suppose... Supposing I give it to you. No, thanks. You mean you wouldn't take it? No, no, I couldn't. Well, supposing if you didn't take it, I just threw it away. Oh, but you shouldn't do that. Oh, I won't. I won't. We were just supposing. Now, goodbye, Amy. There's no supposing about that. Harry Lyme returns in just a moment. As I walked to my hotel, I thought about La Faire Emerald. It cost me about $100 to bribe the custom official, the champagne, and the gold filigree pin. The reward left me with a profit of $270-odd plus a bump on the head and a hole in my suit. I'd lost the lovely green emerald and the lovely green eyes of Amy. The emerald didn't bother me too much, but Amy. (laughs) Amy. She nearly interfered with the great romance of my life. My love for Harry Lyme. We present Haunted Stories of the Supernatural, The Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins, adapted for radio by Derek Hodenot. Here's your ale, sir. Ah, thank you. Ah. 
Uh, landlord, uh, is it possible to hire a gig from you? Uh, I came from Ferndale this morning to meet a fellow practitioner here, but my horse went lame and I have no means of transport home. We're rather busy, as you can see, sir, but I'm sure I can spare one of my men. John! John! Yes, sir, Mr. Warren? Has Robert come back from that errand yet? No, sir. No, I see. Then you'd better wake up Isaac right away. Sir? Wake up, Isaac? If you pardon me saying so, landlord, that sounds rather odd. Do your ostlers go to bed in the daytime? This one does, sir. He dreams, too. Dream? Terrible dreams, sir. He cries out in his sleep and he tosses and turns. Really? Uh, landlord... I have a fancy for seeing this man before you wake him. I'm a doctor, and if this strange sleeping and dreaming of his comes from anything wrong in his brain, I may be able to help. I rather think you'll find his complaint past all doctrine, sir. But if you'd like to see him, you're welcome, I'm sure. He's in the stable, if you'd like to follow me. <laughs> You see what I mean, Doctor? Yes. How old did you say he was? Nearly sixty. Well, he looks a withered old man of eighty. I know, sir. I was shocked too when I saw him for the first time. It made me feel cold inside. <laughs> Look, you see how restless he is? He's going to speak. Wake up! Wake up, man! Uh, uh, it's always the same, uh, sir. Don't touch him. But if you want a gig, sir. Shh, shh, shh. Light grey eyes. With a droop in the left eyelid. Flaxen hair. With a gold yellow streak in it. All right, mother. Fair white arms with a down on them. <laughs> the knife? Always oh, the cursed knife! First one side, then the other. <laughs> you she devil! Where is the knife? <sighs> God, how he suffers. Do you know anything about this man's past life? Yes, sir. I know pretty well all about it. And an uncommon queer story it is, to be sure. Most people don't believe it, of course, but it's true, for all that. I'd like to know more about him, if I may. Landlord, I'm in no particular hurry. Uh, will you tell me his story over some lunch? Perhaps we could share a bottle of sherry. Your health, sir. You too, landlord. <clears throat> well, it's a dreadful story, sir. He seems fated. You know what I mean? A man without luck. Everything seemed to go wrong for him from the start. His father died when he was a baby, and his mother had a fair struggle bringing him up, with the result that Isaac arrived in middle life with an ailing mother, no savings, no wife or children. Then, through his mother, he heard of a job going as a stable helper at a gentleman's residence in a town about 18 miles away. So she packed Isaac off one morning, and he walked there reaching the house in the late afternoon. Uh -huh. Gone. Well, bad luck struck again, because he found on arrival that the post had already been filled. Isaac took it well, however, and before starting for home, he learnt from a nearby inn that he might save a few miles by following a new road, which he took. Just as it was getting dark, the rain started to come on. The wind began to rise. And the first house he came to was a lonely roadside inn, standing on the outskirts of a thick wood. <laughs> uh, 
evening, innkeeper. Evening, sir. You're lucky. I was just about to lock up. Have your room for the night, please. If you can pay. Oh, I can pay. I have some money with me. Would you like some food? Well, if I have enough. Let's see. Yes, you have enough. I'll lock up first and then I'll show you to your room. I thought I... Oh, oh my God. Who are you? Go away. Knife. Oh my God. Help. Wake up. Help me. Please. Get away. Oh, please. Don't kill me. Help. Wake up. Wake up there. Murder! Murder! Great God's sake! Whatever is the matter? In my room, a woman with a knife or a buckle on handle. There's no one here, sir. A flaxen-haired woman, light grey eyes. She, she jabbed at me with the knife twice over. Look, I'll, I'll show you where she stabbed. She seems to have missed you twice, too, sir. I dodged the knife as it come down. It struck the mattress each time as I turned. Otherwise, I'd, I'd not be alive to tell the tale. Devil fly away with you and your woman with a knife. Look, sir, there isn't a mark on the bedclothes anywhere. What do you mean by coming into a man's place and frightening his family out of their wits by nothing more than a dream? I'll leave your house at once, sir. Better out in the road in the rain and dark on my way home than in this room. After what I've just seen. Isaac, tell me, what time was it when you saw this fair woman holding that knife with the buckhorn handle? Just after two o'clock, Mother. Two, two o'clock in the morning, this morning, in fact. Today is your birthday, and two o'clock was the time when you were born. But I, I, I don't understand. No, Isaac, listen to me. I want to write all this down. Oh, I, I want to know every detail about this dream of yours, this terrible ghost with a knife. Ghost, Mother? Oh, of course. You seem to be making a great fuss over nothing more than now, a dream. Isaac, you... now tell me once again, all you told me a minute ago, when you spoke of what this woman with the knife looked like. Now, please... She had light grey eyes, with a droop in the left eyelid, flaxen hair... Oh, no, no, not so fast, my son. Flaxen hair. Flaxen... Yes, no, go on. There was a gold, yellow streak in it. Gold? Yes. White arms with what? down upon them. With down upon them? Mrs. Scratchard wrote down every detail of the dream and added the year, month, day of the week, and the time in the morning when the woman had appeared to her son. Then she carefully locked up the paper in her writing desk. Was that the first time Isaac dreamt about the woman, then? Yes. Then, one day, as the evening drew on, Mrs. Scratcher discovered that a bottle of tonic medicine, which she was accustomed to take, happened to be empty. Isaac immediately volunteered to go to the chemist and get it refilled. It was as rainy and bleak an autumn night as on the night of his terrible dream. On going into the chemist's shop, he was passed hurriedly by a poorly dressed woman on her way out. The glimpse of her face struck him as she descended the doorstep. Oh, good evening, Mr. Scratchard. Uh, uh, good evening. My mother's usual tonic, please. Of course, sir. It's going to be a stormy night, by the look of it. It is, indeed. 
Here you are, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, I see you noticed the woman who was in here just now. Uh, yes. Who is she? I don't rightly know, but it's my opinion there's something wrong with her. She's been asking for laudanum to put on a bad tooth. Master's out for half an hour, and I told her I wasn't allowed to sell poison to a stranger in his absence. It's a case of suicide, if ever there was one. Suicide? Oh, yes, you can tell. How is your mother these days? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I I must hurry. Uh, good night. Good night, sir. Excuse me. Excuse me, but are you in distress? Can I be of help? <laughs> I look like a, a comfortable, happy woman, do I? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean... My name is Rebecca Murdoch. I have ninepence left, and I thought of spending it at the chemist securing a passage to the other world. Whatever that is, it cannot be worse than this. Oh, no, you, you mustn't talk of killing yourself. I, I mean, that's terrible. I, I'd stop you. Uh, even if I followed you about all night, I, I, I'd stop you. Well, sir. I see. Maybe I won't give you that trouble. You've given me a fancy for living, speaking kindly to me. Come to Fuller's Meadow at noon tomorrow. And you will find me alive to answer for myself. I promise. Perhaps this will help. No. No money. My ninepence will go to get me a good night's lodging as I want. Good night, sir. Good night. Fuller's Meadow. It is strange. But I believe her. And did he go? He did indeed, sir. And a few meetings later, completed his total infatuation with her. In less than a month from the time when he first met her, Isaac Scratchard had consented to give Rebecca a new interest in existence by promising to make her his wife. Ah. And from that moment on, she took possession of him, directing him on every point in his behaviour towards her and his mother, of whom she seemed intensely jealous. Oh, did Isaac tell his mother of his marriage plans? Yes. On the same day as he contracted it. And what did Mrs. Scratchard say? Well, she showed perfect confidence in her son by flinging her arms around his neck and giving him joy of having found at last a woman to comfort and care for him after she was gone. Mm. She was all eagerness to see the woman of his choice. And the next day was fixed for the introduction. Mother? Oh, you're here at last, Isaac. Well, where is she? Outside, in the hall. What is she doing there? Are you hiding her from me? Bring her in here, my boy. I cannot wait to meet her. Very well. Rebecca, this way. Mother, this is Rebecca. Isaac! Mother, are you ill? Doesn't this woman's face remind you of something? I don't understand. What does this mean? Does your mother want to insult me? Oh, my God, look at her. Just look at her, my son. I am leaving, Isaac. No, one moment. Let me look closely at you. Take your hand from my arm. Mother, please. You're hurting me. Mother, leave her alone. Look at her, Isaac. It is her. Don't you see, my son? It is her. Rebecca! Rebecca, come back. Isaac. Mother, you look so ill. What has Rebecca done? Light grey eyes, a droop in the left eyelid, flaxen hair with a gold yellow streak in it, white arms with down upon them. Remember, Isaac, don't you remember? The dream woman. She is the dream woman. No, mother. You're mistaken. And yet... Yes, when we first met, I had a strange feeling. I had a strange feeling that I had seen her face somewhere before. You had, my son, in a dream. Oh, beware, Isaac. Let her go and you stop with me. 
Please, Isaac, do as I ask. Stop with me. I cannot, mother. I have promised to marry Rebecca, and marry her I must. Three weeks later, Isaac and Rebecca were man and wife. After some quiet months of married life, as the summer was ending, and the year was getting on towards the month of his birthday, Isaac found his wife altering against him. She grew sullen and contemptuous, and eventually took to drink. Oh, how dreadful. A woman consumed in drink is worse than any man. What did Isaac do? He had been in a sadly despondent state for some time before he realized Rebecca had become a drunkard and was keeping company with drunkards. His mother's health, as he could plainly see every time he visited her, was failing fast and he upbraided himself in secret as being the cause of her bodily and mental suffering. Then she noticed the change that was overtaking Isaac and he told her about Rebecca's drunkenness. To his astonishment, she got up, dressed, and prepared to go out. Mother, where are you going? You cannot go out, you're too ill. I am not long for this world, Isaac, it's true. But I shall not feel easy on my deathbed unless I've done my best to the last to make my son happy. I mean to put my own fears and my own feelings out of the question, and to go with you to your wife and try what I can to reclaim her. Give me your arm, Isaac, and let me do the last thing in this world and help my son before it's too late. And how did this go? Very well at first. The meeting between Mrs. Scratchard and Rebecca passed off much better than Isaac had anticipated. It was a relief to him, therefore, when Rebecca began to lay the table. Then she brought in the bread, cut a slice from the loaf for her husband, and returned to the kitchen. At that moment, Isaac, still anxiously watching his mother, was startled by seeing the same ghostly change pass over her face as on the morning when Rebecca and she first met. Isaac... Isaac, my son. Mother, what is it? Oh, take me home, please. Come with me now and never come back here again. What is the matter? Oh, take my arm and help me up. Take me home. Oh, please take me home. Well, what has Rebecca done this time? Tell me. Did you not see what your wife cut the bread with? I was not noticing. What was it? Well, look at it. A new clasp knife with a buckhorn handle. The knife in the dream, Isaac. The knife in the dream. When Isaac got his mother home, she pleaded with him not to return, but he did. You see, he had to get the knife. Meanwhile, Rebecca had discovered their secret departure. She had been drinking and was in a fury of passion. The dinner in the kitchen was flung under the grate, the cloth was off the parlour table, and the knife was gone. And did Isaac look for it? Not at first. Unwisely, he asked Rebecca for it. The knife with the buckhorn handle. Where is it, Rebecca? You want the knife? Why? Give me a good reason. I want it. No reason, no knife. I'll find it if I have to search every inch of this house. Search for it, then search. But you won't find it. And his search was unsuccessful. When night came, he left the house and walked the streets. He was afraid now even to sleep in the same room with her. Then, five days before his birthday... His mother died. Ah. Her last words in this world were addressed to him. Don't go back, my son, she said. Don't go back. Well, surely Isaac heeded his mother's last warning. He couldn't. He was obliged to go back if it were only to watch his wife. Then she announced that she would assert her right to attend his mother's funeral. And on the day appointed for the burial, she came into her husband's presence inflamed and shameless with drink. What do you think you're doing? What does it look like? You're drunk. That's right. Oh. How did you guess? You're not going to my mother's grave in that condition. I have the right, as your wife, 
If I say I'm going, I'm going. I wouldn't miss the opportunity of making sure she's gone. You evil creature. I won't have you standing by the graveside in a drunken stupor. And who is going to stop me, pray? Not you, Isaac. <laughs> Not dear little Isaac. <laughs> stop it! <laughs> Rebecca, I, I... No man has ever struck me twice. And my husband shall never have a second opportunity. Set the door open and let me go. From this day forth we see each other no more. All that night, Isaac watched and waited. But no footsteps came near the house. The next night he stayed awake and watched again. And the next, until overcome by fatigue... He laid down in his bed, in his clothes, with the door locked and the key on the table and candle burning. But his rest was disturbed. Twice he woke, without any sensation of uneasiness. But the third time, it was that never-to-be-forgotten shivering of the night at the lonely inn all those years ago, that dreadful sinking pain at the heart, which aroused him in an instant. <laughs> Who's that? Rebecca. Rebecca. You've come for me. Oh, my God. He sprang upon her, almost at the instant of seeing her, and taking from her the knife with the backhorn handle. You told me we should see each other no more, and yet you've come back. It is my turn now to go, and to go forever. I say we shall see each other no more, and my word shall not be broken. I will leave this house at once. Excuse me, sir. What? Oh, oh, it's, it's you, Constable. I hope you don't mind me asking, sir, but are you all right? All right? Yes, I, I'm all right, thank you. You startled me, that's all. It's rather late to be walking the street, sir. What time is it? Two o'clock in the morning. Two o'clock? That's right. You sure? Oh, as sure as I'll ever be. Why, sir? Because it's my birthday. It was indeed his birthday, yet had he escaped the mortal peril which his dream foretold, or had he only received a second warning? The knife was in his possession, but a new mistrust of his wife, a vague, unspeakable, superstitious dream, had overcome him. It was daylight when he returned to the house. He ventured indoors, listened, and heard nothing. He went up, at last, into the bedroom. It was empty. A picklock lay on the floor, betraying how she had gained entrance in the night. And that was the only trace of her. She had gone. Two or three months after these events, Isaac Scratchard came to me, withered and old-looking before his time, as you saw him just now. He's as sober, honest and willing a man as there is in England. As for his restlessness at night and his sleeping away his leisure time in the day, who can wonder at it after hearing his story? I suppose he's afraid of a return of that dreadful dream, that nightmare, and of waking out of it in the dark. No. The dream, the nightmare, comes back to him so often that he's got to bear with it by this time. It's the fear of his wife that keeps him from sleeping at night. And has she never been heard of yet? Never. But I have it on good authority that she's dead. Dead? Yes, sir. But I she... told Isaac, sir, but he doesn't believe it. Two in the morning, he says, is the time, all the year round, when he has got to have the buckhorn knife safe about him. He does not mind being alone, as long as he's awake except on the night before his birthday, when he firmly believes himself...
to be in peril of his life. The birthday's only come round once since he's been here, and then he sat up with the night porter. But if she's dead, she can't harm anyone. No, sir. Not according to Isaac. He still says she's after him, itching to get her hands on that knife. She's looking for me, is all he says when anybody speaks to him about the anxiety of his life. She's looking for me. She may be dead. She may be alive. It's all the same to Isaac, sir. She's still looking for him. And who's to say he's wrong? Are you, sir? <laughs> that was The Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins, starring Charles Kay as Isaac, Maureen O'Brien as Rebecca, Richard Bebb as the Doctor, and Douglas Blackwell as the Landlord. Catherine Parr played Mrs. Scatchcard. Others taking part were David Timpson and Danny Schiller. Do not break the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. Double Threat The noise within the police precinct drowned out the bigger noise of the city without. But the office of Inspector Brogan was quiet. He had said all he was going to say. And now he waited for the little man to speak. The little man with the patch on his forehead and the bandage around his arm. The little man who sat opposite him. The puzzled little man with the nervous eyes and the tense, staccato speech. But I tell you, Inspector, I ain't mixed up with them guys. We found you with them. I know, but, but that was only an accident, my being with them. The whole thing is an accident, even from the beginning. Then why don't you tell me about it, from the beginning? What's the use of telling? You won't believe me. Nobody would believe me. The whole thing is a case of nobody believing me. All I know is that we found you with them. If you don't start talking, I'll believe plenty. Oh, what the heck. I got nothing to lose, I guess. Except my neck. That's right. Might as well spill it. Well, you know me. I'm Joe Morris, and I drive this hack, see? This was a couple of days ago, see? And I was cruising along, minding my own business, when this guy hails me. I pull up to the curb... And he gets in. Where to, mister? Anywhere, but make it fast. What's the big rush, buddy? There's 20 bucks to step on it. That mean anything? 20 bucks? She's all yours, buddy. Now, where do you want to go, friend? Joe Morris. That's you, isn't it? 
That's what it says on the license under my smiling face, friend. Joe, I'm going to be frank with you. In fact, I got to be. You're the only one that can help me now. I got to get away. I'm being followed. You mean one of those cars is tailing us? I'm sure of it. <laughs> Don't look that way to me. You got to believe me, Joe. I'm in a terrible spot. You see, I'm on a special mission carrying an important letter that can help all of us. All of humanity. It's got to be delivered. Slip the oil to me easy, pal. You don't believe me, huh? Well, take a look at this shoulder. They got close enough to get a bullet hole into me yesterday. Now, listen, friend. I don't want no part of this, see? I don't want to hear no more. There's a caddy coop following me, like you said. I'm going to shake him, and when I do, you scram quick, see? You got to do this for me. There's the envelope, and there's 500 bucks. I can't explain now how important it is. When you deliver it where it's addressed, there's a thousand bucks more waiting for you. Oh, look, mister, I'm making a quick stop at that corner. Get out and get out quick. I'm leaving the envelope and 500 bucks on the back seat. Hey, listen. I'm counting on you to get that envelope delivered. No, wait a minute. And don't cross me, brother. Hey, come back. You can't do this to me. Come back. Hey. <laughs> I yelled after this guy, but he just ignored me. Then all of a sudden... These guys in the coop that was following us were plenty smart. They'd found us all right. My fare started running back to me. It was time to get moving. I started to shove in the clutch. Funny, my, my fingers had got kind of stiff. Couldn't seem to work right. He was hit. Again. I could see him out of the corner of my eye. Stagger. Stop. Stagger. And kind of keel over easy and slip down into the sidewalk like he'd never want to get up again. Smitty, get that guy in the cab! They got him. They got him, sure. But they weren't going to get me. Hey, stop! Hold it! Hey! I stepped on it. Hard! After a while, I got to thinking. Five hundred bucks. I counted them. My wife, Bess, was going to like that. I looked the envelope over. It was addressed to Mr. Kramer. K-R-A-M-E-R. Hotel Crescent. I opened it. A key dropped out. It was little. It wasn't a house key. There was... Only one piece of paper inside, and the writing on it didn't make no sense. Like a secret code. Yeah, that's what it was. See, maybe this dead guy wasn't giving me a spiel after all. Maybe this paper was a plan that some right guy ought to have his hands on. Something that had helped the country. Then I thought, things like that never happened to me. Oh, stop kidding yourself. Be smart. Play it safe. Pocket the 500 and call it quits. Nobody knows anything about it but you and the guy that was bumped. But that 1500 in one lump would sure look good. Double or nothing. Come on, Joey, where's the old nerve? Double or nothing. Why not? <laughs> Yes, sir. Can I do anything for you? Yeah. Yeah, I want to see Mr. Kramer. Just a moment, please. I'll see if he's in. Excuse me. Kramer? Uh, Kramer? I guess that's it. He, uh, checked out early this morning. He left no forwarding address. Oh, I see. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, excuse me. Did I hear you ask for Mr. Kramer? What's that? Kramer. Are you looking for Kramer? No. No, I ain't looking for Kramer. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. And so long. Be seeing you. What's that? I said I'd be seeing you. Thought to myself, what am I getting into? I should have kept out of that hotel. I should have steered clear, sticking my nose where it didn't belong. Burn the letter quick, a voice keeps yelling in my head. Burn the letter and take a powder before some mug steps on your face. Well, I drove out to the sticks and burned the letter and got rid of that key. And then headed back to the house. Altogether, it must have taken two or three hours. And when I got there, brother, 
when I got there. Hello, Joe. How are you? Huh? Talking to me? Who else? Remember me? Remember the little talk we had at the Crescent Hotel? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, say, how come you know my name and where I live? Easy. I copied down your license number. There's a way of getting a hacky's name and address if you know his license number. Okay. Okay, what's on your mind? Did you read the paper? About the guy that was shot just after he got out of a cab? Tell you a secret, Joe. I happen to know who this double-crossing jerk was. And a friend of mine tells me that this jerk jumped out of a cab just like yours. Now, listen, mister, I don't know nothing. Just call me Smitty, Joe. And you know what else? I think this guy who was riding in your cab, I think he'd give you a letter. Listen, fella, you're bucking up the wrong tree, too. That letter I... was addressed to Mr. Kramer. And I'm telling you like a brother that Mr. Kramer don't like his mail held up. In fact, you can hand it over right now. I ain't got no letter. I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, Joe, you're kind of dumb for a family, man. What do you mean? Well, I've been checking around, Joe. I know all about that wife and kid. You know, a family man is supposed to protect his wife and kids so nothing happens to him. You get it? Now, you and I know Mr. Kramer don't live at the hotel anymore, so I'll expect you to have his mail on you the next time I call. I'll be seeing you, Joe. And you know, I keep my word. Come on, Joe. I think. Think. The gears in my head wouldn't turn over. They were frozen. I knew I shouldn't have burnt the envelope. I could have handed it over and that would have been the end of it. Then I got worried about Bess and Jimmy. Suppose something happened to them. I had to go upstairs right away and see. See that nothing would happen to Bess and Jimmy. Hello, Joe. Have a hard day? Nothing special, Bess. How's Jimmy? He's sleeping, thank heaven. I finally got him off to bed. Did he cough much today? No, not much today. Maybe that medicine's doing him some good. He even ate his soup today. Don't you worry none, Bess, honey. We're going to take care of Jimmy. We're going to give him all the sunshine and dry climate he needs. His own old man ain't going to let him down. See this? Joe. 500 good American smackaroos, and it's just the beginning. Joe, where did you get all that money? Now, you promised me you wouldn't gamble. You said you'd stay away from that bunch of petty crooks. I haven't fooled around with any of those guys since Jimmy was born, honest. Well, then how did you make $500? I, I can't tell you, Bess. Well, then I can't take it. Well, that makes me look good, doesn't it? Here I twist my brains inside out trying to get hold of the coin to take care of Jimmy. And when I get it, you don't want no part of it. Well, well, somebody gave it to me just like that. So it's mine and you can take it. No, no. Well, that's gratitude. There it is on the table. Do you want it? Do what you want with it. I'm going out. I was tired, angry. I didn't care about anything anymore. I just walked to my cab, figuring I'd get in and cruise around a while, trying to relax. Well, I gets my hand on the door handle, but I don't have time or the strength to open the door. Believe me, I had a right to freeze. I've been waiting for you, driver. Sorry, mister, the cab's taken. Yeah, I've taken it. Get in. I don't think you heard me, bud. I said, I... What, what? What's that? A shiny little 38 runt. Get in. I get nervous. Okay. Okay. Put it away, will you? Got the uh, envelope on you? Huh? What envelope? What are you talking about? The letter Smitty wanted from you. Smitty? Cut the act. I've been trailing the boat here. Look, I don't know, Smitty. He just stepped into my cab and... That's all right, runt. I don't like Smitty either. And he don't like me, Lefty. You didn't give that mug the letter, did you? No. Then hand it over. I ain't got it. Is that a fact? Honest, I, I don't, honest, mister. I don't know what, what this is all about. 
Linus, I, I'm just a cabbie trying to get along. And... Put up that meaty. Now drive. Drive. I'll tell you where to go. A friend of mine wants to see you. Keep going straight. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> Joey Morris squirms restlessly in his chair opposite Inspector Brogan as he continues his story. His story of an envelope left in his cab by an unknown passenger. Of the murder of this passenger. Of a man named Kramer to whom the envelope was addressed. Of a man named Smitty who wanted the envelope. And a man named Lefty who wanted it too. Well, so far your story makes sense. What happened after Lefty got into the cab? He made me drive to an old wooden house at the edge of town. We climbed up a flight of dark stairs, and then he knocked on the door. Sounded to me like a signal. Go on, go on in. This is the cabbie, boss, Joe Morris. Well, I'm sorry we've put you to all this trouble, Mr. Morris. Who are you? Kramer is my name. I believe you have a letter for me which you received from a friend who is, unfortunately, no longer living. Speak up, speak up, Mr. Morris. I, I don't know anything about it. I know you have the letter. Now, if you're worried about the money you're supposed to get... Don't you believe me? I ain't got it. Was it a thousand? Uh, fifteen hundred, then. All right, how much did Smitty offer you? I'll top it. Nothing. I don't know why you keep picking on me. I ain't got the letter. I, I burned it. Take a good look at me. Know who I really am? Yeah. I saw your picture in the papers yesterday. You're Big Eddie. Well, you have a good memory, Mr. Morris. I just got out. Did a five-year stretch, but I've still got a very good memory, too. I never forget a double-crosser. You know, Smitty used to work for me. Now he's trying to cut in on me. You mean he ain't part of your gang? That's right. He's not connected with my organization. So if I were you, I wouldn't give him that letter. But I tell you, I ain't got no letter. I, I got scared. I burned it. Very interesting. I understand you have a family, Mr. Morris. Is that right, Lefty? Yeah, that's right, boss. We just come from where he lives. Now, we don't like to get violent, Mr. Morris, so I'll expect that letter sometime tomorrow. Lefty will get in touch with you. You can go now. But I'd stay away from that rat, Smitty. It won't be safe around him. Well, there I was. Two gangs wanted one letter that I didn't have. I thought... Maybe I ought to spill it to the cops. But it was so mixed up, I figured they wouldn't believe me neither. The cops couldn't believe me. Smitty didn't believe me. Big Ed Kramer didn't believe me. Even my wife, Bess, didn't believe me. I got behind the wheel and cruised around for a while and then headed for my friend Willie's pool room. I can dope a lot of things out when I'm shooting pool. What's the matter, Joey? You sure are off your poor game today. It's like taking candy from a baby. Anything wrong with Jimmy? So, Joe, hmm? don't look now, but there's a tough heading for you. X likely knows you. Hello, sweetheart. Got the envelope? Now listen, Smitty. Be a regular guy. I told you I didn't have no envelope. That what you told Lefty? You know, I get around, I seen you with him. Lefty got that letter? No. I haven't got no letter for you, and I haven't got no letter for Lefty. Tell me another one. Tell me you wasn't looking for Kramer at the hotel. I was. I had the letter then. But after I got scared, I, I burned it. Burn the key, too? No, I threw that away. You little rat. Uh, Joe, there's a telephone call for you. Okay, go get it. I'll be waiting right here for you. Hello? Yeah, this is Joe. Mr. Morris, this is Kramer. I just want you to know that Lefty and I are watching you and Smitty from across the street. Don't give him my letter. Hello? 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 Hey, Willie? Willie? Yeah. Yeah, Joey, what is it? That, that guy I was talking to, Smitty, where'd he go? Oh, that guy? Oh, he saw some guy looking at him through the window and beat it through the back door. Anything I can do for you, fella? No, thanks. This is something I got into myself and I... Got to figure it out myself. 
figure it out for myself. <laughs> what good's one letter you don't have when two tough guys want it? Now, if I had two letters... If I had two letters, then... A crazy idea popped into my head. I ran over with it to Willie's office. A L I R L four X six dash 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 J. That ought to do it. Makes as much sense as that other letter I burnt. I put one copy in each envelope and one small key. Maybe giving each of them a letter would do the trick. Maybe I'd be free and clear again. You got it? Yes, Smitty, here it is. Oh, no, thanks. No, I don't want no money. If you're smart, you'll forget you ever saw me. Well, Runt, you got it? Yeah, Lefty, here it is. Oh, no, no, I don't want nothing. If you ever see me or Big Ed again, you never laid eyes on it. Get it, Runt? That was that. If I didn't see them again, I'd know it worked. And that Joey Morris had pulled himself out of a jam again. If it worked. Oh, Joe, there was a man asking for you today. Said he'd call again. Hey, Joe, a couple of fellas asking for you. One of them was that same guy. Joe... Some fellas around the pool room an hour ago asking for you. They want to... But it hadn't worked. Why had I ever thought it would? Crazy idea like that. I decided I, I had to get out of town for a while, lay low. I headed home to tell Bess. trouble when you brought all that money home. I knew it, Joe. I knew it. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, Joe, why don't you go to the police? Stop gabbing at me and listen to me. Keep the door locked and don't open it except for Willie and me, understand? Yes, but why? Poor Bess, please don't ask questions and don't let Jimmy down in the street by himself, understand? Don't let Jimmy down in the street by himself? But, Joe, what is it? What's the matter? Nothing, only don't. 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 <laughs> I got back to the cab, but I never had a chance to turn the key in the ignition. There was an old friend of mine waiting, Smitty. Slip me a phony letter and think you can get away with it, huh? Let's go. Smitty, believe me, I couldn't help it. They made me do it. Yeah? Honest, I was bringing you the real letter when they stuck a gun in my stomach and took it away. Then they give me that phony one to give to you. You expect me to fall for that? (laughs) Killing me ain't going to do you no good. I'm just a little guy. Big Ed Kramer's got the letter now. If you're lying, if you're giving me another wrong steer, you won't know what hit you when I catch up with you. I watched him walk down the block. It was getting dark, and after a while, I couldn't see him at all. I thought maybe, maybe I ought to call the police like Bess said. Maybe I ought to talk it over with her. Tell her everything. I went back into the house and up the stairs, until I got to my floor. He was waiting in the shadows, practically in front of my door. Hello, Mr. Morris. Kramer. I thought you'd be coming this way. Mr. Morris, I always take my hat off to a smart guy, slipping me that fake letter. What could I do? There was one letter and two guys wanted it. I quite understand your position. Now, Lefty's outside. We're going to get in my car and drive off. Now, Smitty is up the street waiting for us in his car. And he's going to follow us to a nice, dark spot. And you know what? You're in on this all the way. After this, I think you'll listen to reason, Mr. Morris. There was no arguing with this Kramer guy. That gun he had handled scared me plenty. Lefty was waiting, like he said, and we drove off. We only went maybe half a mile to where there was some vacant lots, and Kramer made me get out. Smitty's car had been following us about a couple of blocks down, and we could hear it purring in the distance. Get in the middle of the road, Morris. In the lights. Fast now or I'll blow your head off. And wave your hands. That's it. Wave them. That'll stop your friend Smitty. Hey, you. 
What's the idea? Let him have it, Lefty. He's as good as dead right now. <laughs> They murdered him as quick as that. The air smelled funny, but most of it was gasoline. At first, I thought the bullets had hit the gas tank, then... Don't pour it all there, Lefty. Spray some of that gas on the back seat. We've got another can left, boss. Well, snap it up. Say, what's going on? What are you doing? Very simple, Mr. Morris. I want you to watch Smitty disappear with your own eyes. Then you'll be sure. You won't have anyone to worry about but me. You got it? I got it. Right under the ribs. First they killed him, and now they were going to burn him. This guy wouldn't stop at nothing. Bess wasn't safe. Jimmy wasn't safe. Uh, Lefty, give us a hand with this stiff. <laughs> he sure put on weight since he was with me. I pulled out a pack of smokes, unconscious, and a book of matches. Then it come to me like a flash. Get it over with. Burn him. Burn it all. Burn it all. Hey, Morris, put that light out. What do you think you're doing? Get away from that gas, you fool. Lefty, stop him. Get him before he... That's all I remember, Inspector, till I woke up here in the police station. You dead sure about that? Honest. If you'd only get my wife and ask If her... it weren't for your wife, you might not be here, alive. How's that? You see, Morris, your wife notified us. After she overheard Kramer hold you up in the hall outside your apartment door. That's what saved your life. We went looking for you and Kramer. We've had our eye on that big boy since he left jail. You mean you, you believe me, Inspector? Except for one point. One point? Yep. And I want the straight goods, Morris. Did you really burn that letter? Honest, Inspector, I told you. I'm sorry I ever saw the okay, letter. Okay, okay, I believe you. But too bad. That letter would have told us where Kramer's friend hid all the money his gang stole before we sent him up the last time. Well, we'll run across that safe deposit vault someday, somewhere. You can go now, Morris. Gee... Thanks a million, Inspector. Thanks. Oh, by the way, Morris, I got to be at 125th Street in 20 minutes. Run me up there, will you? 20 minutes? Gee, I, I'm sorry, Inspector Brogan. I, I couldn't make it in 20 minutes. You see, I'm cruising at strictly the legal speed limit from now on. <laughs> From shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. <laughs> Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Hermit, you're next. For 
heaven's sake. What is it, Dan? A gas? Couldn't be, Charles. Denon filled up at the last stop. What is it, Denon? For heaven's sake, Nan, how do I know? Well, that's that. Ooh, I hope we don't get stranded in this forsaken territory. Well, that'd be something, wouldn't it? We haven't passed a house in the last three hours. Well, I might as well get out and see what I can do. You want me to take a look at it, Denton? No. I'll tinker with it a while. You and Nan sit down on the side of the road. I might be able to find the trouble for you, Dan. Charles was only trying to help, Dan. Never mind, I say. I have a thing going in a moment. Do as I say. Sit along the road. I'm going to work. Come on, Charles. Let's do as he says. Just as you say, Denton. Here's a nice place to sit, Charles. We can look right down into a valley from here. Why, it is nice, isn't it? See? You can look all over the valley. I wonder what they call this place. I wouldn't know. Oh, look. We're not so far from civilization as I thought. A town at the lower end of the valley. Yes. Now, that's still a long way away. You see? The road takes a roundabout way along the rim of the valley. Uh-huh. Say, uh, I bet that's where I'm going to work. Do you think so? I'll just bet you that's where the job is that Denton got for me. Way out? Away from everything? Oh, I don't know. Looks like a nice little town. I'll make out all right. I hate to have you leaving us, Charles. I'll be terribly lonesome. Oh, I'll get back to the city occasionally. You must be sure to do that. Sure I will. Man... Denton can't hear us talking from here, can he? No. I have a feeling that he managed this job for me way out here because he didn't want me living with you two anymore. Oh, no, Charles. Why should he object to my own brother living with us? You've got me there. I can't figure it out. When I first came to stay with you, Denton talked of getting me work close by. I know he did. Man, there's something strange about it. I don't know exactly what you mean, Charles. Yes, you do. Ever since Denton came back from that road trip, he's acted strange. Now that you mention it, I think I have noticed something different about Denton. He was jolly and friendly enough to me when I first arrived. And now all of a sudden he's changed. Maybe we're imagining it all. Doesn't seem that he'd be jealous of his wife's own brother, does it? No. Denton's not like that. But he has been for the last ten days... Morose, sullen, sitting most of the time staring at me. Maybe he feels I've been paying more attention to you than to him. Maybe that's it. It's only natural that I'd be solicitous of my own brother, whom I haven't seen for so many years. Uh, we won't talk about it anymore. All I hope is that he isn't ill, that you aren't going to have trouble with me so far away. You said we mustn't worry about it. We won't. No. I do wish he'd get the car started. He wouldn't let me help him. Fairly pushed me away. Denon's frightfully independent. But I wish he'd hurry. Nervous? I think we're going to have a storm. We should be getting out of these hills and down into town quickly. Say, the sky is getting black and gloomy. Look over to the west. The clouds are piling up fast. Something of a wind coming up, too. Denton just stands there looking at the car as if he didn't know what he was doing. Maybe he doesn't. Well, let's go back over. Maybe you'll let me help him now. All right. Watch your step. There are jagged pieces of rock here. That wind's getting stronger every minute. It sure is. Looks like we might be getting a tornado. How are you making out, Denton? What? Located the trouble? We should hurry, Denton. There's a terrific storm coming up fast. Can't make the car go if it doesn't want to. Look at the sky, Denton. We're in for a real storm. Wow. There goes my hat. No use chasing it now. Please, hurry. Get the car started. All right. All right, get inside. Maybe it'll go now. Let's hurry. Oh, we'll have to drive. 
drive like mad to get out of these hills and into the village before the storm breaks. I know these roads. I'll get you out all right. Denton, don't be so cross. Jump on every word Charles says. Then don't give me orders. and hurl us down the hill. Wow. That was a peal of thunder. Denton. Denton, we can't drive on in this. No. No, we can't. What are we going to do, Dan? Can we sit in the car and be safe? We aren't going to sit here. We're going to make for shelter. But where? There's a house sitting up there on the rock. It's so dark, I can't see it. There's a house up there. I got caught in a storm the last time I was through here. Climbed up to that house and stayed until it blew over. Can we get up there all right? We can make it. We'll have to. Get out of the car. We've got to start right away. Hurry. Climb out. Give me your hand, Dad. It's in the middle of the afternoon and black as night. Oh, we've got to climb fast. We'll all take hold of hands and start up the rock. We've got to get to that house. We've got to get there. Give me your hand, Nan. Don't hurry. Come on. We're here. Are you all right, Nan? All right. Knock on the door, Dan. We don't have to knock. We walk right in. What? Hurry. Get inside. Oh. Oh, what a relief. I, I thought for a few minutes we might not make it. I'll bolt this door so the wind won't rip it open. Who owns this place? Doesn't anyone live here? There was no one living in it when I stopped on my way through here last time. But it must belong to someone. It's completely furnished. Whoever owns it hasn't been here for a long time, then. Everything's covered with dust and cobwebs. I can see them even in this pale light. It's so dark in here. Can't you find a lamp or something, Denton? I'll get a light. There's one in this room off the hall. Come on, Charles, let's follow him. I don't like standing in this dark hall. I found a lamp. I'll have it lighted in a moment. Oh, it... So damp and cold in here. Ooh. There. Huh. Light makes it better, doesn't it? Some. Maybe. I don't like the looks of this place. At least we're out of the storm, man. You stopped here on your last trip through, Denton? And there was no one living here then? That's what I said, wasn't it? But it's completely furnished. Surely someone lives here now. Maybe they do. They aren't here now. It's almost like a dungeon in the room. Windows are built so high. Something like a fort. But it's grand Denton knew of this place. It shells her out of the storm. The wind couldn't blow this building over. Denton. What? What are you staring at? What? You heard what I said. What are you staring out into the hall for? Say, Dan, are you all right? Don't clench your hands that way. What do you see? Did I say I saw anything? What's the matter with you? Don't keep asking me questions. I've got you out of the storm. Isn't that enough? Now leave me alone. Where are you going? Where are you going, Denton? Stop him, Charles. Don't you think we all have a sit in here? When the storm blows over, we can drive on. What's wrong with him? He's moving like a person in a trance. Get him to come back in this room. Are you ill, Denton? Is there something we can do? 
Stay right where you are. Both of you. What is it? I'm going into that... that room across the hall. But why... why don't we all stay together? It's dark in here. I don't like it. I want you to stay near me. I said I'm going into that room across the hall. And I'm going alone. Your brother Charles will take care of you. You prefer his company, don't you? Is that what's wrong with you? Why do you act this way toward my brother? You might as well make up your minds. Both of you. That we'll stay in this house until morning. I'm going into this room to sleep. Stanton! It's no use. He is ill. He's got it in for me. Come on. Let's go back where the lamp is. Listen. You hear what he's doing? Barricading the door. What does all this mean? Oh, Charles. Let's get back to where the lamp is. It's as if he's lost his mind. Sit down. It's been coming on him for some time. Ever since he made that last trip through here. We know that. What shall we do? Why did he go into that room and leave us? As soon as we get into town, we'll persuade him to see a doctor. Let's make the best of it now. If he wants to leave us and sleep, let him. Oh. It's tough on you, Nan. I'm sorry I've brought you all this trouble. Denon's never been this way before. There's something dreadfully wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Oh, is that Denton laughing? No, it can't be. He's never laughed like that in his life. <laughs> oh, it's coming from the room Denton went into. That's for sure. He's going mad. Oh, Charles. Come on. You'll have to let us in. Denton? Denton, what is it? Let us in. Dan, let us in. Locked? Bolted and barricaded. Denton, please let us in. <laughs> it is coming from in there. But it's not Denton. It can't be. Oh, what are we going to do? What shall we do? <laughs> Everything's all right now, Nan. He's quieted down. He answered you the last time you went over to the room? Yes. He said, I'm all right. Go away. Oh. I think he's going to sleep now. We might as well do the same. I can't sleep in this horrible house. Yes, you can. It'll only be a few hours before morning. But what if Denton refuses to come out of that room in the morning? Well, he'll be better in the morning. The storm's passed over, too. Everything will seem different in the morning. Leave the lamp burning. I'm scared. Sure. I'll set it on the mantel. It won't bother our eyes, but it will shed some light. Yes. That will be all right. You think Danton will sleep? I think he's asleep now. I'd break the door down, then if I thought it would do any good. But I think it's best to let him get over this spell by himself. I'll never believe it was he laughing. Who could it have been but Danton? Oh, now, don't worry anymore. Try to get some sleep. If he calls out, I'll wake you up. It seems like a nightmare, doesn't it? It will in the morning. Everything will be different then. Go to sleep now. You need the rest.
standing over you. They're going to kill you. Go! Good heavens. What is it? What was that? Oh, Charlie. He stood right over you with his hands reaching out for you. Who? And when I screamed, he ran. For heaven's sake, who? He was going to kill you. Charles ready to kill him, eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> now, back to the hermit. Terror-stricken Charles and Nan stand in the middle of the room in this strange house on Lost Man's Bluff, wondering who tried to kill Charles. Listen. <laughs> you mean you think it was... I know it was Denton. Oh, that's ridiculous. Denton trying to kill me. I know it was he. With his hands reaching out for your throat. Oh, no. And when I screamed, he ran back into that room and closed the door. Charles, where are you going? I'm going to get him out of that room before something really happens. You mustn't go near him. I've got to. No, you stay here. Never. I'm going with you. I'm going to make him let me in there. He may try to kill you again. I don't think he will. You stay behind me. Denton? Denton! The door's unlocked. Denton. Denton. Stay back, man. I'm going to light a match. Huh? Great heaven. Denton. What is it? Oh, get back. Don't look. Why are you closing the door? What is it, Charles? What did you see? No. Denton's... Something's happened to him. Something's happened to Denton. What is it, Charles? Tell me quick. What is it? Denton hanged himself. <laughs> Keep hold of yourself, Nan. We've got to get out of here. Down into town and get the authorities here. Denton. Denton hanged himself. Let's hope the car runs. We've got to get into town. <laughs> <laughs> the laughter again. Look. Look. Up at the top of the stairs. What, what is it? In this faint light, it, it looks like the figure of a man. Yes. But you can see right through him. <laughs> <laughs> Disappeared. Standing there at the head of the stairs, pointing at us. Then vanished. That same laughter. Charles, you're not going up there. We're going to get out of this place right away and get help. Quick, hurry, we must get help. Well, I tell you, it's urgent. You've got to go up there right now. Go up to that house on Lost Man's Bluff before daybreak? Right now. Oh, no. Not me. But my husband is dead in that house. Would never enter the door of that house at night. No, sir. Neither would anyone else in this town. Denton is dead. He ain't the first one to die up there. What do you mean? Ain't never heard of the house on Lost Man's Bluff? No. We don't live around here. Oh, well, that explains that. What did you mean when you said that Denton was not the first man to die there? Five years ago, a fellow that owned that house killed his brother. Then hanged himself. What? That's right. But hanging didn't seem to take him out of this world. Well, I ain't the only one that's been there, passed there at night and heard his wild laughter. Uh, it's fit to make the hair stand right up on a man's spine. Uh, other folks tried to live in that house. But you know what happens to them 
When they go in a certain room in that house? The room Denton tried to sleep in? The desire to kill enters in them. And the laughter of him that belongs to the other world drives them mad. They can't get away from it. They return to the place. Charles, that's what happened to Denton. He said he'd been in that house before. They try to kill. If there's anyone near to kill, and then they take their own lives. It's happened to three other people. One man got back to town and told his experience. But he went back up there a few weeks later and took his life. Hanged himself. Oh, no, sir. You'll have to wait till morning. Won't get nobody to go up there in the night to that house on Lost Man's Bluff. on Lost Man's Bluff continues to pierce the night. Don't ever go near it after sundown. No. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dream. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Mr. Danton and I had gone again to the Welcome You Ranch on the Arizona desert for a short vacation. The day after our arrival, we set out on horseback to explore the country. Say, hey, Bart. Yes, Inspector? It's certainly good to get away from it all for a while, isn't it? Get away from what, Inspector? Oh, the ham drum, the hurly burly, the howler skelter, the murders. <laughs> yes, I see what you mean, Inspector. This is a life for me. Sunshine, fresh air, the wide open spaces, and a good horse under me. And no murders. Yeah, I said that, no murders. <laughs> well, what do you say we turn around and head back for the welcome you? A good meal, a good night's sleep. Head back. Come, Inspector, we've only been away from the ranch a half hour. A half hour? That's right. Is that a fact? <laughs> Seems to me like we've been gone all day. Hey, what's the matter? What are we stopping for? Look over there, Inspector. Huh? Over where? I don't see anything. There's something lying on the ground near that uh, giant cactus. Huh, so there is. Must be a fallen log or something. There are no logs in this country, fallen or otherwise, Inspector. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, that's the body of a man. I was afraid you'd say that. Come on, Inspector, let's have a look. Come on, boy. Whoa! Oh. Whoa, oh, boy, easy now. Oh. Yeah, it's a man, all right. So I see Get off your horse, Inspector. No. Okay, why is it that these murders have to follow us all over the country? Let's not assume that this is a murder yet, Inspector. By Jove, he looks done in, doesn't he? Yeah, let's roll him over. Right. Say, look at the whiskers. He's an old man. Yes, and quite dead. Now, I wonder... Suppose he was hit by an automobile? That's a brilliant, Inspector. Imagine the nearest automobile road isn't more than 20 miles away. I was just supposing... Let's see... No marks of violence. Suppose he died a heart failure. Mm, 
I doubt it, Inspector. Why, for crying out loud, can't a man die a heart failure if he wants to? Oh, that's odd. What's odd? The boots. Our friend here is wearing a pair of brand new boots. Yet the rest of his costume consists of a patched pair of jeans and a faded shirt. Now, look, Bart, do you have to try and make something out of nothing? The guy just died. Let him lie in peace. How old would you say the gentleman was, Inspector? How old? Mm-hmm. Who cares? Seventy, maybe? Yes, at least seventy. And those brown stains on his beard, would you say they were tobacco stains, Inspector? Yeah, tobacco stains. Now that we've reached those amazing conclusions, let's go back and report to the local sheriff. Probably he was a prospector, wouldn't you say, Inspector? Yeah, out here they call him Desert Rat. Right. What are you doing? I'm removing this poke from the old man's pocket. Uh Uh-uh. You see, it's full of gold dust. There's a small fortune in this poke, Inspector. There is, eh? Yes. Now, consider the inconsistency. Here is a man carrying a fortune in gold around with him. The only thing he has to indicate such wealth is a pair of new boots. Okay, okay. Now, look, Bart. Suppose we... Inspector, this is one of the most interesting cases we've come across in a long while. What do you mean, case? A guy dies a heart failure. Hey, there's a babe on a horse. Yes, and a very attractive-looking young lady. Another inconsistency. With that, I can agree, but what's a good-looking babe like that doing way out here? Yeah, we'll probably know in a minute, Inspector. Here she is. Whoa, 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 boy. Whoa. Well, this is a surprise. Imagine finding two civilized-looking men way out here. We were just thinking the same thing, lady. Uh, by the way, what's the matter? Is that a man? Why, for goodness sake. Is he someone you know, miss? It's Hardtack Wiggins. What's the matter with him? He's dead. Well, well. So they caught up with the old boy at last, did they? Caught up with him? Who? Oh, one of the bunch was after his gold. I imagine it was either Oliver or Matt who murdered him. Murdered him? Look, lady, he wasn't murdered. He died a heart failure. You want a bet? Want a... Now, wait a minute. We... Open his shirt, good looking. And if you don't find a knife wound, I'll never make another wager. Go ahead, Bob. Open the old guy's shirt. Some people have just got to be shown. Hmm. I think that might be a good idea, Inspector. There. By Joe. There is a knife wound. Of course there is. There had to be. Why did there have to be, Miss? Because Hardtack couldn't have died of heart failure. Why not? Because yesterday he was examined by Doc Sandbar and Coyote Wells. And the doc said that Hardtack was in perfect health. Well, I'll be... Lady, you seem to know a lot about what's going on around here. Naturally, I do. What's wrong with that? What's wrong? Nothing. Not a thing. Except that the way I look at it, you're sticking your neck into a noose. (laughs) I suppose by that you mean that you think I murdered old Hardtack. Yeah, you're quick to catch on. That's exactly what I mean. (laughs) Now, naive you are, darling. Darling, now look. Inspector, I told you this is one of the most interesting cases we've run across in a long time. Pardon me, miss. Were you uh, well acquainted with Hardtack? Well acquainted? That's right. My dear boy. Hardtack was my husband. How much farther is it? I'm getting doggone tired of carrying this dead body around in my lap. It isn't much farther. Want me to spell you for a while, Inspector? No, I'll keep them. Somehow I feel more natural when I'm lugging a corpse around. There's the shack now, down in that little hollow. Shack is right. Don't tell me that you and this, I mean, your husband actually lived there. Of course not, Inspector. You don't really think that I could abide a hovel like that, do you? I don't know. I don't know. The way things are shaping up, I'm willing to believe most anything. How long had you and Hardtack been married, Mrs. Wiggins? No, not very long. Oh? The city hall in Coyote Wells opened at 9 o'clock this morning. And we were married 15 minutes later. This morning? Well, for crying out loud, if this isn't a screw, you see... Inspector Wiggins. Huh? Tell me, Mrs. Wiggins. Oh, darling, would you mind not calling me Mrs. Wiggins? Give me the creep. What shall I call you? Surely, darling. Very well. I'll compromise. Stop calling me darling and I'll call you, Shirley. That goes for me, too. Well, what strange men you two are. Most men are Yeah, but we are not most men. And if you think we are strange, you better get out a mirror and take a gander at yourself. (laughs) Now that that's settled, I'd still like to ask a question. But of course, Barton. How long have you known the heart attack before you married him, Mrs. Wiggins? Two days. Two days? Things happen fast out here, don't they? 
I've read about this romance on the range stuff. But oh, that... Inspector, uh, let's face it. You know as well as I do that there wasn't any romance connected with my marriage to Hartek. We're quite aware of that, Shirley. So suppose you tell us why you did marry him. He was lonesome. Oh, come, Shirley. He was lonesome and he wanted someone to help him spend his money. Now we're getting places. Well, I'm certainly not going to pretend that I married Hartek for any other reason than the fact that he was wealthy. I'd be a hypocrite if I did. I don't know which is worse, being a hypocrite or being a murderer. Oh, don't be silly. I didn't murder the old billy goat. Shirley, what makes you so sure that Hardtack was wealthy? Because he discovered a pocket of gold two weeks ago. And the ass heir has appraised its value at half a million dollars. Half a million bucks. And all the poor guy got out of it was a pair of new boots. Yes, isn't it a pity? Poor dear. Been wanting a pair of new boots for so long, but up till now he couldn't afford them. And bought them for his honeymoon, eh? I suppose so. Hardtack's been poor for so long that he just didn't know how to spend his money. I imagine you plan to help him out on that score, eh, Shirley? Oh, but you're so cute. It's exactly what I planned on doing. Oh, my goodness. What's the matter now? Those two horses standing in front of the shack. They belong to Matt and Oliver. And who are Matt and Oliver? Matt Palmer. He's the son of Hartack's dead partner, Chris Palmer. I see. And who is Oliver, Shirley? Oh, Oliver's last name is Runyon. He's Hartack's nearest neighbor. They're both terrible people. What's terrible about them? You'll see. Well, here they are now. They heard us coming. Yes, and by the expression on their faces, they're rather unhappy about something. It's about time you got back here, Shirley Milton. By golly, you needn't think you're going to get away with this. Not by a jug full, you're not. Hey, look. Look at what's draped across that sap. Yeah. Why, it's hard take. What's the matter with him? He's dead, Bob. Stuck with a knife. Know anything about it? Dead? You mean the old coot's really dead? Oh, don't act so surprised, Oliver. You know he's dead. It was you who killed him. Me? Dad, blast you, girl. I'll wring your neck if you say that again. I never laid a hand on the old codger. Sounds convincing, doesn't he, Bob? Keep quiet, Inspector. Let them talk. This is interesting. Now I see it. I see it all. Shirley, you married him because you were afraid we'd get some of the money. How quick you are, Matt, darling. And I suppose you murdered him for the same reason. I murdered him? Are you crazy? (laughs) What good would it do for me to murder him? No more good than to do me. There's only one who would benefit from hard tax death. His legal heir. How sweet of you to admit that I am my dear husband's legal heir, Oliver. I'll anticipate some trouble from you. Really, I have. And you're going to get it. By gum, you are. I was with Hardtack when he discovered the pocket. I helped him. Half that there gold belongs to me. Belongs to you? <laughs> That's a hot one. <laughs> Listen, my old man was Hardtack's legal partner. So what if he was? I'm my old man's heir. Half of what Hardtack found is supposed to be mine. Any court in the country... Boys, boys, aren't you forgetting that since I am Hardtack's widow, all of what he had will go to me. I ain't forgetting nothing. I know my rights. And I know mine. Any court in the country will back me up. Well, Barton, now do you understand what I meant when I said they were terrible people? Yes, yes, I understand a lot of things. Has it occurred to any of you that giving Hardtack a decent burial would be your chief concern at the moment? He'll be buried. Don't fret about that. Say... Who be you two anyway? We be policemen now. What do you think of that? We don't think anything of it. We don't believe it. Shirley, where'd you pick up these dudes? I didn't. They picked me up. They're staying at the welcome you. Dudes, eh? Well, dudes, you can leave us hard tax body and get out. We don't like dudes. And we don't like murderers. Inspector, when Sheriff Tanner deputized you this morning... Did he give you the authority to arrest any suspicious characters? Huh? What was that, Bart? Oh, yeah! Yeah! Sure he did. Fine. There's no doubt in our minds that one of the three people standing here in front of us murdered Hardtack Witten. Now, look here, you... And that's right, isn't it, Inspector? Huh? One of them... Oh, sure, sure. No doubt about it at all. We got the proof. Haven't we, Bart? We certainly have, Inspector. We know which one of these three thrust the knife into the heart of Hardtack Wigan. Huh? <laughs> no, we no, know answer, why doesn't. and how and when. Yeah, yeah, sure we do. We got the evidence to prove it, too. Haven't we, Bart? We have, Inspector. And by virtue of the authority vested in you by Sheriff Jim Tanner of Cactus County, Arizona, I demand that you arrest the guilty person. <laughs> You don't think that tying that guy up and leaving him back there in Hardtack's shack is 
going to do any good to you. Not a bit, Inspector. Then for crying out loud, why did you tell me to do it? We had to do something to convince them you have the authority to make an arrest, Inspector. Yeah, but look, why didn't we just take the guy and lug him into town and turn him over to the sheriff and charge him with the murder of Hardtack Wiggins? Because Hardtack wasn't murdered, Inspector. Hardtack wasn't, huh? But for the love of Joshua, what are you talking about? Oh, <laughs> come, Inspector. You know as well as I that that knife wound was made after Hardtack was dead. I do? How long have I known it? Ever since you examined the wound and saw there was no blood, Inspector. Oh, no blood, eh? Say, I did notice that, didn't I? Now that you mention it. You know as well as I that blood doesn't flow from a wound that is made after death. Sure, sure. I've known that for years. Was there anything else that I noticed when we examined the body part? Yes. We both noticed the Hardtack shirt didn't have a hole in it. So we wondered how the knife wound could have been made unless someone had first opened the old man's shirt. Say, that's an angle. What does it prove? I don't know, Inspector. It might prove a lot of things. Well, here we are. We're there. Whoa. Oh. Whoa, boy. We've arrived, have we? Where are we? Well, Inspector, I'm surprised. This is the spot where we found Hardtack's body, remember? Well, well, so it is. What do we do now? We get off our horses and look around. Oh. Okay, but I don't know what you expect to find. There's the depression in the ground where Hardtack lay, and there is footprints clearly outlined in the sand. Yeah, I see them. Say. Yes, by the looks of those footprints, it appears as though poor old Hardtack was pretty close to exhaustion, doesn't it? Or drunk. Oh, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, Inspector. Come along. Where are we going? Let's backtrack on his trail a bit and read signs. Read signs? Say, where'd you pick up that expression? I listen to the Lone Ranger program, Inspector. They seem to uh, jump in. Judas, look out, there's a snake! Uh, uh, it's a rattler. Get your gun, Inspector. Don't worry, I'm giving up. <laughs> nice work, Inspector. What? You shot its head off. Sure I did. It was his head I was aiming at. Oh, I see. Pardon me for the compliment. <laughs> well, come on, let's get going. You don't have to apologize, Bart. I can't help it if I'm a good shot. <laughs> What's the matter? Look, there. Isn't that an empty whiskey bottle? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Well, I guess for once the old inspector was right, eh, Bart? Hmm? How do you mean, inspector? Why, those staggering footprints, the empty whiskey bottle, the guy was drunk just like I said. Hmm. What do you mean, huh? Hmm. Oh, stop saying huh for crying out loud. And don't start telling me I'm wrong. Doggone it. It's as plain as... Yes, it. Inspector, this is certainly the most interesting case we've come across in a long time. Come on. We're going back to the shack. Why? What are we going back there for? Because the evidence that proves how Hardtack died and who murdered him is there. <laughs> Darling, I had to get rid of Oliver, didn't I? Well, it took you long enough. Here, get me out of these ropes. Okay, um, okay. You see, there's a knife over here on the table. Yeah. Drake and Denton will be back any minute. we got to get out of here. Get out of here? Well, where do you think we're going? Now, hold still while I cut the ropes there. There. Well, that feels better. Oh, those crazy fools tying me up and leaving me here. What do you care? I can't prove that you murdered Hardtack. I didn't murder him. I've already told you that. Well, it wasn't your fault, though, was it, darling? You tried hard enough. Well, don't get cute, beautiful. I'm not in the mood for it. Okay, okay. So you didn't murder the old codger. So what are you getting in such an uproar about? Don't be a dope. If Drake proves I stuck the knife into hardtack, that'll be just as bad as proving it was me who killed him. So? So we're heading for the border right now. Now, just a minute, good-looking. Take it easy. We've gone to an awful lot of trouble to get our hands on old hardtack's dough, and we're not going Listen, to run Listen, baby, get smart. The dough won't do us any good once we're sitting in the gas chamber. What do you mean, once we are sitting in the gas chamber? That's it, baby. I said we, and I mean we. You're in this as much as I am. But you're crazy. It was you who handled that knife. And it was you who married hardtack. After first making a deal with me to knock him off on your wedding day. Remember? Why, you lousy bum, i You what? Man. Don't look at me like that. You what, baby? Matt, I... I... Oh, oh, Matt, don't. Call me a bum. <laughs> Try to make me take the rap for knocking off that old billy goat. Oh, please, Matt. I... Oh, Matt, Matt, don't hit me again. I didn't mean it. I... Honest, I'll... I'll go with you. Uh, you bet your life you will. Now get your stuff together and let's get out of here. Oh, all right, Matt. Don't hit me anymore. Matt. Well, what are you doing? I'm borrowing your husband's new boots. 
the only thing he had that was any good. And I'm taking him. Oh, man. Hartack waited for those boots so long. Shut up. Um, what good will they do him now? Well, I'm going to get something out of this deal. Okay, Matt. Okay. Uh, only stealing a dead man's boots will bring you bad luck. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. Glad you're Whoa. Well, the shack looks just the same, doesn't it, Inspector? Yep. It looks as though the birds have flown the coop. Oh, I see. Both the horses are gone, huh? Well, let's get off. Go inside and have a look. Yeah, well, they're gone, all right. The door's wide open. Yes, just as I expected. Shirley came back and released Matt Palmer. There are the cut ropes lying on the floor, Inspector. And by the way, things are scattered around. They got out in a hurry. Come on over here, Inspector. Uh-oh. What's the matter? Look, there's Hardtack lying on the bunk where we left him. Only someone removed his boots. Probably Shirley. Do you see the boots uh, lying around anywhere, Inspector? No, but... Which means they were stolen, probably by Matt. Come on, Inspector. We've got to catch those two before they reach the border. <laughs> You've been drooping in your saddle like a, like a dish rag. Mm, nothing. Nothing wrong with me. How much farther to the border? Mm, ten miles, maybe. But say, what's eating you, anyhow? You look half shot. Oh, there's nothing the matter with me, I tell you. Come on. Let's get going. Hurry, Inspector. They can't be much farther ahead. They better not be much more of this, and I'm going to quietly lie down and expire. Oh, you're all right, Inspector. Just hang on and grit your teeth. Grit my teeth. My teeth were all shaken loose an hour ago. Look, Bart, how do we know we're even going in the right direction? Why, we're reading sign, Inspector. Uh, See? The trail was right there in the sand, as plain as Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue. Oh, what a beautiful thought. <laughs> you think we'll ever see it again, Bob? Well, we won't unless you stop complaining and get a little speed out of that nag you're riding. Come on, man. Matt? Matt, wake up. Hmm? Huh? What? Is something wrong? Well, there will be and something wrong unless you snap out of it. The border's still a good five miles away. Oh. Five miles. Oh, that's too far. I uh, can't make it. What do you mean you can't make it? You've got to make it. Oh. Matt, Matt, you're falling out of your saddle. Oh, uh, got to lie down. Matt? Got to lie down. Matt! Oh, Matt, what's the matter? Oh, Matt. Matt. Matt, get up. Get up. What's happened? Oh, Matt, open your eyes. Oh. Matt. Got to reach the border. Up. I murdered old Hartack. I killed him. I killed him. Oh, I, I'm a murderer. Man, stop it, stop it, stop it. Someone will... Man! Oh, man, here they come. Here come Drake and Dan. Get up, man. Get up. Oh, terrible pain. Terrible. Oh, I guess I'm going to die. No. I, I, I guess I'm going to... Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Something happened to your boyfriend, Mrs. Wiggins? Hey, Bart, look, he's got hard tack boots on. You were right. He did steal them. I told him. I told him it was bad luck to steal a dead man's boots. I hmm. told him. A pity Matt wasn't as suspicious as you, Mrs. Wiggins. I'm afraid your erstwhile lover is dead. Dead? How do you know? What did he die of? Matt Palmer, Inspector, died of snake poisoning. <laughs> There's the welcome you down there in the valley. Which is all right with me. A welcome you is a welcome sight to these tired old eyes. <laughs> come, come, Inspector. You should be in better spirits. We've just completed one of our most interesting cases. Yeah, well, give me the details, Bart. Well, there aren't many details, Inspector. You see, Matt didn't discover that Hardtack was dead until after he'd driven that knife into him. Then he covered up the wound with Matt's shirt. Hoping that whoever discovered the body would think Matt died of snake bite, which of course he did. Yeah, but why did Hardtack have his shirt open in the first place? Why, that's obvious, Inspector. 
Hardtack apparently stepped on the rattler, and the snake struck him. And Hardtack killed the snake, eh? Yes, by trampling the rattler to death. Incidentally, Inspector, that was the same snake that you shot. Whoa! You mean I shot a dead snake? <laughs> yes, I'm afraid you did, Inspector. Well, I'm a bang tail maverick. Get up! <laughs> you see, Inspector, the men at Hardtack realized he'd been struck. He finished off that bottle of whiskey we found lying beside the trail. Wanted to die with a jag on, eh? No, there are still some old timers who believe that whiskey is an antidote for snake bite, Inspector. But the fact is that just the opposite is the case. So the booze only made him worse, eh? Yes, I'm afraid so. He staggered along, probably suffering horribly. When he finally collapsed, he must have clutched at his shirt in his anguish and torn it open. The poor old guy. And Matt Palmer came along and stuck a knife in him, eh? That's what happened, Inspector. Uh, and Matt died the same way, eh? Almost. It was Hardtack's new boots that killed Matt. Uh, the boots? What are you talking about? When the snake struck Hardtack, the old man apparently slashed down at it with a stick or some other object he was carrying. The blow broke off the rattler's fangs while they were still embedded in the soft leather of the boots. Well, I'll be... Uh, and... When Matt put on the boots, the fangs were still there, eh? That's it, Inspector. You see, the boots fitted Matt snugly, and there was enough venom left in the fangs to work into his bloodstream and after a period of time to kill him. By golly, what do you know about that? Just like the girl said, it's bad luck to steal boots from a dead man. Yeah. Say, what about the girl? Oh, we'll have to let Sheriff Tanner settle that for us, Inspector. And, uh, by the way... Yeah? When we reach the welcome you, I think you'd better not mention our experience of the day. No, why not? Well, Inspector, we're out here on a vacation, and I'd just as soon that the folks didn't know that mystery is my hobby. <laughs> Roger Elliot, otherwise known as the Mystery Man, inviting you to join us for another storytelling session here at the House of Mystery. Well, Johnny, how was that picnic last week? Well, just well. Oh, it was wonderful, Mr. Man. Simply wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. I hope you're all remembering to stay outdoors as much as you can. Getting lots of air, sunlight, and exercise. Yeah, and uh, postcorn toasties. Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, Johnny. I don't think I understand that. Well, that's easy. Get lots of air, sunshine, exercise, and postcorn toasties. I thought you said your mother wouldn't take postcorn toasties on picnic. Well, uh, at first she wouldn't. But you found the way. Yeah, <laughs> I found a way, all right. Without dishes and spoons, too, Miss Jean. Well, how can you eat post-corn toasties without a bowl and a spoon? I uh, give up? I give up. Right out of the fresh protective box. Uh, just like uh, post-corn toasties was uh, nuts. Or candy or popcorn. Post-corn toasties are delicious that way. That's a wonderful yeah. idea. Yeah. No fuss, no bother, but still you can take post-corn toasties with you on your picnic, automobile trips, or swimming parties. Just tuck a fresh protector box of post-corn toasties in with your luggage and eat those tender, crisp, golden brown flakes as you would nuts or candy right out of the box. And you can be sure of one thing. The special fresh protector box will keep post-corn toasties fresh and crisp until the last golden flake has been eaten. Thank you, Ruth and Johnny, for a wonderful suggestion. Oh, that's okay. And now I see it's time for today's mystery. The story I call A Gift from the Dead. In 
It began in a hotel in San Francisco, where I'd taken a room to wait for Paul Sheldon, an old friend of mine who was flying in from Kansas City to join me. Some weeks ago, Paul and I had been invited by his sister, Jane Kovarak, to spend a few days at her home in the beautiful but rugged Big Sur country, 150 miles south of San Francisco. We'd accepted Jane's invitation with enthusiasm as evidence of her complete recovery from the shock of her husband's death. For my thoughts were miles away when the bellboy knocked on my door and handed me a letter. It was from Jane. I opened it and began to read. But I was hardly beyond the first line when a vague feeling of uneasiness crept over me. The note was brief and to the point. She was canceling her invitation. As the day wore on, I reread the letter several times, each time feeling more uneasy. And by afternoon, I found myself pacing restlessly back and forth, impatient for Paul's arrival. I was about to leave for the airport to meet his plane when a long distance telephone call stopped me. It was a woman, her voice tight with panic. Mr. Roger Elliott? Yes? Who's this? My name is Craig, Miss Alma Craig. Yes? I'm Mrs. Pobrack's housekeeper. I see. Mr. Elliott, you must come at once. Mrs. Pobrack needs help. But I just got a letter from her canceling the invitation. I know, that's why I'm calling. We're in danger, Mr. Elliott, you must come. What kind of danger, Miss Craig? The master of this house has returned. We've heard him, he's here. Basil Kovrak has come back. Mr. Elliott, he's come back from the dead. With a sharp click of the receiver, Miss Craig's voice was gone. Something had to be done, and quickly. I packed my bag, checked out of the hotel, and drove at once to the airport. Paul's plane landed as I arrived, and from the gate I watched the passengers unload. As Paul hurried toward me, a messenger handed him a telegram. He stopped to read it, and the smile of greeting quickly vanished from his face. I went through the gate to meet him. Roger, read this. It's from Jane. Paul, am canceling invitation. Please do not come. Explanation follows. Jane. What do you make of it, Roger? I fly over 2,000 miles to visit her, and then she tells me to stay away. Well, you're not going to. We're going to see Jane, and I think we'd better hurry. A bank of heavy clouds hung over the ocean to the west as we turned onto Highway 101 and started toward the Big Sur country. As the miles clicked by, I told Paul about the letter I had received from Jane and the frantic phone call from her housekeeper. When I repeated what she'd told me about Basil Kovarak, Paul's eyes grew hard, and he spoke with an undertone of bitterness. Roger, I opposed that marriage from the first moment I met Basil Kovarak. I could understand why Jane was so completely infatuated. He was handsome, wealthy, and thoroughly educated. But to me, there was something cold and brutal about him. Something odd and difficult to define. And he was proud, almost insanely proud. The Kovarak name is an old one. A titled European family, wasn't it? Yes, Basil was a count or something. The last heir, I believe. Well, immediately after the marriage, he took Jane to live in the house where she is now. Oh, it's a strange place, Roger. Huge and rambling. Perched on a cliff overlooking the sea. Nothing modern in it except the telephone. Kovarak kept it exactly like a like an ancient feudal castle. Well, was he in business, Paul? How'd he spend his time? Well, near as I can tell, he devoted all of it to preserving the Kovarak family traditions. He had no other interest. He and Jane lived there alone. No one else but the two servants, Miss Craig and a handyman, was ever permitted on the place. Not even I. That's strange. Certainly doesn't sound like Jane. Oh, gee, Jane's rotten. Why, when they'd been married about three years, I visited her unexpectedly. And would you believe it? She refused to see me sent word she wasn't feeling well. But I saw Basil. He came out of his library while I was waiting at the door. He looked at me with those strange, dark eyes of his. Then he approached me. I got the coldest reception of my life. Mr. Paul Sheldon. Hello, Basil. You've come to see my wife, I presume. Yes, I plan to see my sister. Mrs. Kovarek does not wish to be disturbed. And I, for my part, do not wish the routine of my household disrupted. We have nothing in common here with the outside world. And it is not our wish to change. But I don't understand. I've There's come a no long need way. to pursue the matter further, Mrs. Kovarak, and I do not wish to be intruded upon. 
Miss Craig. Please show Mr. Sheldon out. So there was nothing for me to do but go away. And that's a pretty accurate picture of Basil Kovrak, Roger. He had Jane so completely cowed that she saw no one. Even her letters became stiff and cold. Well, Paul, you said Basil died a year ago. How? It seems that he and the handyman, a fellow named Christopher were both killed when their car plunged over a cliff and fell into the sea. And, Roger, I'll say this. If it's possible for any man to come back from the dead, that man would be Basil Kovarek. Paul fell silent. It was dark when we reached the coast at Monterey, and soon the road became a shelf with the Pacific Ocean far below on the right and the Santa Lucia Mountains rising sharply on the left. The highway twisted painfully along the jagged coast. And then, I saw it. The house built by Basil Kovarak, hunched up from the granite that surrounded it like a malignant fungus growing out of the stone. It was dark and seemingly deserted. We stopped the car, got out, and ran up a path to the entrance. Paul was about to knock when the heavy door inched open. Miss Craig? Oh, Thank heaven it's you, Mr. Sheldon. And... Uh, this is Roger Elliott. Hello, Miss Craig. Oh, Mr. Elliott, it was wrong of me to call you. My mistress has ordered that no one be admitted. I don't know what to do. I'm sure it was wrong of me oh, to call worry. you. don't worry. You did the right thing, Miss Craig. How is my sister? She's all right, isn't she? Well, sir, she's Miss hardly... Craig, it's open oh, the door. Hello, sis. Jane. I turned and saw a woman standing in a wide hallway with a lamp in her hand. For a long moment, I stared, refusing to believe that this could be Jane Sheldon. She was drawn and thin. The muscles of her face were held firm against any show of emotion. But her eyes glistened with a cold, unspoken terror. Whoa, Roger. Didn't you get my message? Yes, as a matter of fact, Jane, that's why we came. Miss Craig, leave us at once, please. Very well. I'll be in my room if you want me. Paul, you and Roger must leave at once. Now, Jane, we want to help you, and if you'll forgive me, you look as if you need it. I... I don't want your help. You told me you were fixing the house over, but everything's exactly as Basil always kept it. Yes, except the cat. Cat? Basil had a pair of Siamese cats. He loved them, and I gave them away after he was buried. Now I can't locate them. And Basil's coming back. Jane, dear, please. Basil Kovarek is dead. He's coming back, I tell you. Tomorrow's our wedding anniversary, and he's coming back. But, Jane, you saw him buried. Surely you don't think... Listen. What's that? Hold it. What music? What was it? The jewel box. The Kovrak jewel box. Basil is in this house. Right now. Jane was terrified. She swayed and almost fainted as Paul and I helped her to a chair. And when she recovered, we urged her to tell us what was troubling her. She spoke slowly as if she dreaded the sound of her own voice. That music you heard is the Kovarak music box. It was filled with cut gems when Basil gave it to me. The day he died, it disappeared, and now he's brought it back. Jane... Will you tell us exactly what happened the day he gave you the jewel? Well, Miss Craig and Christopher had gone to town for supplies. I was sitting outside on the terrace when Basil called me into the library. I went in, and on the desk was an exquisitely carved casket I'd never seen before. He closed the door and looked at me a long time before he spoke. We are alone, Jane. I'm going to show you something, an inviolable secret. Promise me you will keep it always. Of course. Today is our fifth wedding anniversary. In token of the occasion, I make you this gift. Oh, beautiful. One moment, Jane, before you open it. Contained in this box is the lifeblood of the Kovarak family. The key to Kovarak wealth and power. It is a grave responsibility. You may open it now. Ah, jewel 
Diamond. Yes. Look at them, Jane. Sparkling and flashing. See, they blaze with a life all their own. The undying fire in those stones has been the symbol of immortality for countless generations of my ancestors. The jewels are yours now. And through them, you are bound forever to the Corvax. They must be priceless. Oh, I'm afraid to keep them here. We must put them in a vault. No. They will stay here in this house. Under your care. But Basil is so valuable, I'd be afraid. It's a timeless tradition that the wife of the Corvax heir keep the casket of jewels. We will not break that tradition. Someday you may come to realize in what sense that box of precious stones means immortality to the cobra. Basil placed the box of gems in my hands and walked out of the library. I took the box to my room and hid it in the bottom of the trunk in my closet. And always before I went to bed, I checked to see if it was safe. After Basil's accident, I went to look at the jewel box. It was gone! <laughs> A few nights ago, I'd heard it playing. Basil, the last of the Kovacs, was coming back from the grave. Jane was trembling as she finished her grim story. Paul tried to reassure his sister, but he was little comfort to her fear-ridden mind. The flickering lamp sent fantastic shadows dancing through the vast dark hall as he led Jane to her room. I called Miss Craig, who was greatly relieved to know we were staying overnight. As I got ready for bed, I turned the curious facts over in my mind. I tried to reason an answer, but there was none. Finally, worn out from the long drive, I fell asleep. How long I slept, I had no idea. At first, I thought I was dreaming. Then I realized something definite had awakened me. The music was playing again. Somewhere in the house, the fatal jewel box had been opened. I jumped out of bed and ran out into the hall. Paul's door flew open a second later. In the wavering light of his lamp, we stood listening intently. At last, the music stopped. A breathless, waiting silence hung in the air. And then... Roger! That's Jane. Come on. We ran for her door, thrust it open, and there she stood in the center of the room, staring in frozen fascination at her dressing table. As my eyes followed her gaze, in spite of myself, a wave of sudden horror made my scalp crawl. For I saw, lying on the dressing table, glittering with blood-red malevolence, a huge square ruby. <laughs> Needless to say, the rest of the night was spent without sleep. At last, morning came, gray and damp. I was waiting in the dining room when I heard Jane and Paul come down the stairs. Paul smiled a weak greeting, but Jane, haggard from the sleepless night and exhausted by fear, came directly to me and seized my hand. Roger, Paul, won't listen to me, but you must. I implore you to leave this house. This is my wedding anniversary, and I know Basil will come back tonight. If you and Paul are here, something dreadful will happen. Jane, dear, that's enough. You're in trouble, and I intend to stay and look after you. If Kovrak comes, I'll be here to face him. Paul, where's the ruby which appeared last night? Why, it's still on the dressing table. Would you mind getting it for me? I'd like to see it. Not at all. I'll be right back. Jane, I want to ask a favor of you. I know that strange and awful things have been happening here, things for which there are no, there's no apparent explanation. Now, you know I firmly believe no man can return from the dead. Please don't give in, Jane. I want you to give me until tomorrow morning to find the answer. Roger, I'm... I'm afraid. Here it is, Roger. Here's the ruby. Oh, thanks. Jane, I think you'd better get some rest now. Don't worry. Leave everything to Paul and me. All right, Roger. I'll try. Poor Jane. This thing's getting her. Me too. Oh, nothing ghostly about this, Paul. A genuine ruby, all right, and from its size, it must be worth thousands. I'd say so. Roger, how did it get on Jane's dressing table? I beg your pardon. Shall I serve breakfast now? In a minute, Miss Craig. Miss Craig, did you ever see this ruby before? See what, Mr. Elliot? This ruby. It was left on Mrs. Kovarak's dressing table last night. Oh, no. Oh, Mr. Elliot, I've got to get out of this house now. When he comes back, he'll get his revenge on me for not telling. Not telling what, Miss Craig? 
Do you know something about the ruby? Yes, sir. You see, Christopher and I, we were sort of planning on being married someday. But he always had big ideas. One day he came to me in the kitchen and whispered that he'd seen a box of wonderful jewels. Did he say where? He wouldn't tell me, Mr. Sheldon. But he said he was going to steal them and run away. He wanted me to go with him. What did you say? I begged him not to do it, Mr. Elliot. I was afraid. What happened then? That very night, the car ran over the cliff and he was killed along with Mr. Kovarak. Miss Craig, do you think Christopher stole the jewels? I don't know. I knew something was wrong the way Mrs. Kovrak kept searching and searching, so I went through all of Christopher's things. But I never saw any jewels until Mr. Elliot showed me the ruby. Oh, Mr. Elliot. I should have told you before, but I was afraid. I've got to leave here. I can't stay in this house another night. <laughs> With considerable difficulty, we're persuaded the badly frightened woman to stay on and look after her mistress. Jane remained in bed most of the day, but as night approached, her courage began to crumble. We gave her a sedative and promised to watch over her through the night, I at her window and Paul in the hall outside the door. Nothing could induce Miss Craig to sleep, and she'd already established a vigil in her room when I took my post outside Jane's window. The storm had cleared and a few stars were visible. But I shivered from the dampness as the hours crept by in slow silence. It was nearly midnight when I heard the jewel box. Paul entered the room immediately, and the music stopped. He came over and spoke to me. Roger, you see anything? Nothing. I heard the music box, that's all. James stirring, but she's still asleep. I don't like it, Roger. I don't like it at all. <laughs> Again, silence descended. Already half the night had passed, and we were no closer to an answer than when we started. I wrecked my brain for a clue. I felt that at one time, something had been mentioned and forgotten, which now fitted into the picture. But try as I would, it escaped me. I started back in my mind over everything that had happened, when suddenly my train of thought was shattered. I rushed into the room. Paul was bending over Jane, shaking her. Jane! Jane! Wake up! Wake up. You're having a nightmare. Oh, uh, uh, I saw it. I saw Basil. Jane, Jane, dear, you must have dreamed it. You were asleep. I've been outside the door all the time. No, no, I saw him. You walked through the room. But it must have been a dream, Jane. Your mind is overwrought. He was here, I tell you. I... Look. Paul and I turned to follow Jane's trembling finger. On her dressing table, in the same spot the ruby had appeared... There now lay a great green emerald. I watched fear creep into Paul's eyes. Then he stepped close to me and whispered in my ear. Roger, let's get out of here. All of us. You and I were guarding this room, yet Kovrak got in here and left an emerald. Let's go while we have a chance. Wait a minute, Paul. Now look here. There's something different about the things on this table. They're not the same as before. An emerald's been added. Yes, the emerald's been added, but something... Wait a minute, I've got it. Did either of you touch anything on this table tonight? No, no. Not me, Roger. Why, George, I think I've got the answer. Jane, let me have some of your face powder. Face powder? It's, it's in that box, but what... Roger, are you out of your mind? Not a bit. We're going to use powder to catch our ghost. Here, you hold this emerald. Now, I want you and Jane to go to my room. I'll stay here and wait for the ghost. Now, let's see, I'll need something... Uh... Yes, this will do. This brass bottle stopper. Roger, please tell us what this is all about. Later, Jane. Just do as I ask, please. Wait in my room and be very quiet. And remember, don't come until I call you. No matter what happens. Reluctantly, Paul and Jane left me alone in what they thought was a haunted room. As soon as they'd gone, I went to work. In a few minutes, I was ready. I turned out the lamp, and the room was plunged into darkness. An hour of motionless waiting passed. My back ached from the strain, but I knew that the slightest move might upset my entire plan. Then it began. Slow, somber, terrible. The Kovarak jewel box had opened. Suddenly, the music stopped. I held my breath and listened. 
I knew that whatever had opened the jewel box was here in this room with me. For a long moment, nothing happened. Then I became aware of a faint, soft stirring from the direction of the dressing table. Something clicked against the glass surface. I must have moved then, for the chair in which I sat creaked loudly. There was a frenzied rustling and thumping. I jumped up from the chair and lit the lamp. There on the table was a flashing blue diamond, and the brass bottle cap was gone. I ran to the door and called out to Paul and Jane. In a moment, they and Miss Craig hurried into the room. Roger, are you all right? We heard the jewel box. The ghost, Mr. Elliot. Where's the ghost? Did you get him? Well, I haven't caught him yet, but I know who he is and where to look for him. Here, Paul, give me a hand with this bookcase. All right. Unless I'm mistaken, we'll find a small hole back here somewhere. That's enough. Hold the lamp closer. Yes, here it is. A crack in the wall in the corner. Bring that poker over, Paul. Let's rip out part of this wall. All right. Along here? That's my guess. That should be enough. Now let me get my arm in there. Yes, here it is. The cover's been sprung. Listen. It's the jewel box. You mean it's there in the wall? Yes. Just a minute now. It's wedged in. Ah. Here it is. The cover at jewel. Good heavens. Look at them. A fortune. Roger, I, I don't understand. How did you know they were here? You see this powder on the table and the floor? Well, I sprinkled it. Why, there's a trail of tiny footprints for it. Like an animal. Exactly. And it leads straight to that corner by the bookcase. That's the answer. What seemed to be the ghost of Basil Kovarak returning from the dead was actually the work of a notorious kleptomaniac, the pack rat. A pack rat? Why, I can't believe it. It's incredible, Roger. Then Christopher must have stolen the jewels and hid them in the wall when he was making repairs in here. No doubt. And he intended to return for them later, but died before he could carry out his plan. But, Roger, I thought pack rats always took things away instead of returning them. They do. They're natural-born thieves. Now, this section of the wall lies between the pantry and the pack rat's nest. Each time he made a trip to steal food, he was attracted by the jewels. He nuzzled his way into the box and... That's when the music played. Then, as he got bolder, he came out into the room here, where he was again tempted by the bright, shiny objects on the dressing table. Now, having no sense of value, he gladly traded this priceless diamond here for a brass bottle cap. The same thing happened with the ruby and the emerald. I got my first real clue when I noticed that your nail file was missing, Jane, when the emerald appeared. And then I remembered the cap. When you got rid of them, you left the way wide open for the pack rat. Oh, Roger, I don't know what to say. I've been such a fool. No, you haven't, Jane. You've got a very vivid imagination, that's all. The fear in your own mind was all that distorted the pranks of a mischievous pack rat into a gift from the dead. <laughs> And that was the mystery I call a gift from the dead. Golly, imagine looking on your table and seeing a big ruby or a diamond or something. Golly. <laughs> yes, but Johnny, imagine if you thought they were put there by a ghost. Well, I wouldn't. I don't believe in no ghost. Good for you. You know, even though I don't believe in ghosts either, I, I felt goose simply all over when I heard that music box. It sounded so, uh, so ghostly. <laughs> Well, I suppose that's why we always have to go on proving ghosts don't exist. But if you're feeling a little weak, Ruth, how about a pick-me-up? Hey, uh, I'm feeling weak, too. <laughs> you found it, Johnny. Really, you don't have to be weak or even hungry to enjoy an extra bowl of delicious post-corn toasties. Post-corn toasties are so light, so delicate and crisp. They make a refreshing taste treat any time of day or evening. Uh, shall I go to the kitchen now? Well, don't you want to hear about next week's story? Uh, yeah, but I want But to... at the moment, the thing you want most is post-corn toasting. Uh, yeah. Well, Johnny, I can't say I blame you. So after I've thanked Horace Braham, Vera Allen, Peggy Carnegie, and Barry Croker for helping me tell my story for today, I'll tell you in just a few words that next week you will hear one of the most baffling experiences in my entire ghost-chasing career. When I solved the mystery of the disappearing claim. I know you won't want to miss it, so be sure to be with us next week at this same time and for our radio listeners, this same station. 
I'll be waiting for you at the house of mystery. Roger Elliott, your mystery man, saying goodbye until next week and reminding you to try the new Post Corn Toasted, the most delicate cornflakes, extra thin and tender crisp. Mother, doctors agree, never serve children coffee. Why? Because caffeine is a drug, a stimulant. While many people can drink coffee without ill effect, others suffer nervousness, indigestion, sleepless nights. So remember, your children's future is in your hands. Avoid tomorrow's caffeine habit. Start them on Post Them now. They'll love its hearty, grain-rich flavor. And good customs like Post Them last a lifetime. Postum contains no caffeine or other drug. It's America's ideal family beverage. Hearty, wholesome Postum. This program came from New York. Stay tuned to Two Detective Mysteries, which follows in a moment. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Makers of Fleischman's Fresh Yeast present I Love a Mystery. I Love a Mystery. Presenting the latest adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie, crime specialists, now engaged by old St. Eustace Griffin to track down and destroy the thing that prowls his decaying mansion in the Los Feliz Hills, Hollywood. <music> Say, you know, one of these days, vitamins are likely to knock war right off the map. What do you mean? Well, if a country is strong enough, it's not likely to be invaded, is it? No. Well, folks are getting wise to the fact that no country can be really strong until its people are strong. And one thing needed is that they get enough of the right kind of vitamins in their diets. For instance, you need adequate vitamin A for normal eyesight, vitamin D along with calcium and phosphorus for sturdy bones and good teeth. And, of course, the amazing vitamin B complex is essential for all-around good health and stamina. Say, a guy needs all those vitamins to be well-nourished. Well, if Uncle Sam has his way about it, we Americans are going to be better-fed men and women. We're learning about nutrition, how to balance our meals, and how to fortify them with extra supplies of essential vitamins. That's why you'll find so many Americans drinking Fleischmann's yeast regularly. It's one of the richest natural sources of vitamin B complex. Drinking Fleischmann's yeast daily is a really pleasant habit to get into. So how about you're getting into it right now? Here you are, Fleischmann's fresh yeast in tomato juice. Drink it, America. To your health. <laughs> a monster in the mansion. A new Carlton Morse adventure thriller. Eight 
eight o'clock at night in the faded elegance of Griffin Mansion, whose grim pile sits on the brow of the Los Feliz Hills, frowning down on Hollywood. Without, the great house weather-stained and sagging with a weary, foreboding droop. Within, the smell of decay, the deep shadows of mourning, and the noiseless writhing of the larva of death. Grandfather St. Eustace called in Jack, Doc, and Reggie to destroy the monster of lust and murder loose in this house. But by 11 o'clock this morning, the slavering fangs had snapped three times. Three times death had struck. Aunt Mary, bound hand and foot, died in her bed with a cat sitting on her chest. And down at the foot of the back stairs lay two more, crumpled and broken. Cousin Jim and Grandfather St. Eustace's secretary and practical nurse, Buck Thornton. Three deaths within the hour. Jack didn't waste a moment. He called the police, and all day they'd been prowling the mansion and questioning the inmates. And now at 8 o'clock in the evening, the three bodies have been removed to the morgue, and the last of the homicide squad is preparing to depart. Captain Friday is giving his final pronouncement to Jack and Doc and to old St. Eustace and his granddaughter, Willie. I'm not in the least convinced that this woman you call Aunt Mary died because there was a cat in the room with her. I don't believe that Buck Thornton and this Cousin Jim person broke their necks falling downstairs while fighting. But, but Captain The Friday... bodies are being held for autopsy. By morning, I'll know whether my surmise is correct. Did you say autopsy? I did, Mr. Griffin. Preposterous. I'm the one to decide that. Packard. Yeah? I'm leaving a man here to help you and your assistants watch this house tonight. That's all right with us. Yes, I'm posting him at the head of the second floor stairs, where he'll command a good view of the hallway, both upstairs and down. He... He won't try to interfere with our normal activities, I hope. No. See here, my man. Well? Have you no idea who is responsible for what has occurred? Well, that remains to be seen. That's all for the present. I'll see you in the morning. Oh, uh, yes, there is one thing. I'm taking Brother Sid with me to the station. Oh, no. Hey, what, what, what's that? That's cruel, Captain Friday. The cruelest thing you could do. Taking Sidney to jail again? Your brother has a record for violence, Miss Griffin. He's only been out of reform school two days, and it's been during those two days that violence has broken out in this house. But if you understood, my brother, if you understood that he's only violent when he gets excited, and then his fingers grow rigid and he wants to choke something, that's the only kind of violence he's ever done. That's plenty. I'm taking Sidney with me. But see here, my man. Uh, see here well, now. Well, there's you... no use arguing. Even if he's not guilty, a boy with his record is better off safely locked up for the present. I... I can go out and say goodbye to him, can't I? If you like. Sergeant Kramer has him out in the hallway. Oh, yes, I have to see him. Okay, Jerry. Stay with her. Yeah, little old Jerry Booker, the shadow. Hey, well, now perhaps I should see him also. So what's the use of creating a scene, Mr. Griffin? Hey, Captain Friday's right, Mr. Griffin. Let him take him away quietly. Find Uncle David's right arm? I ought to know better than that. Here, look in this bottom bureau drawer. Here. The hair that was shaved off of Willie's head. Yeah. This little mayonnaise jar. Fingernail parings. You mean Uncle David? Him complaining about something eating his fingernails down to quick? Cousin Louise, where'd you get these? Come here. Uh-huh. I knew you'd find them. That's what I was going to show Stoney. Where'd they come from? I just found them. Oh, you found the onyx ring off Uncle David's dead finger. Now you just happen to find these here nail parings in Willie's hair. Sure. Louise, be sensible. These may be the clues that'll lead us to the murderer. See? Didn't I tell you, Stoney? What do you know about these, Stoney? Nothing. I never saw them in my life before. Mr. Packard. Mr. Packard, please. Hey, ask Cousin Reggie. Yeah, step out in the hall and see what's the matter with him. Yeah. Hey, Cousin Reggie. Oh, oh, my dear man. Oh, my dear man. I was never so glad to see anyone in my life. Son, do you even wear that there scarf and them gloves with your pajamas? We've no time for that. We've no time for that. What is it, Cousin Reggie? What's the matter? A scorpion. Scorpion? It was in my bottle of sleeping capsules. Crawling over the capsules. Yeah. And that isn't all. In my bottle of emetic powder, larva. The weevil and larva of death. Cousin Richie's room seems suddenly to have come alive with wriggling and crawling things. Could it be that Cousin Richie is marked out for the next victim, or possibly, like Willie, his mind is beginning to turn? 
Before we look into the case of Richie, may we bring you a brief message from the sponsor. Hey, for Pete's sake, Bob, what are you doing with all those magazines and newspapers? Well, doggone it, you've got me so interested in vitamin B complex, I read everything about it I can lay my hands on. Well, there sure has been plenty written about it lately. Yeah, just listen to this headline. Vitamin B complex member seen restoring gray hair. Think of it. Well, I'm afraid it's a little too soon to talk much about that yet. But what's even more important, they've proved that adequate vitamin B1 and G and other members of the vitamin B complex group are absolutely essential to a person's stamina and courage and fighting spirit. Why, it's been rumored that the so-called secret weapon with which they're attempting to keep the little countries of Europe enslaved is a deliberate withdrawal from the people of all the sources of B1 and other parts of vitamin B complex. Gosh, we're sure lucky to be living in America. We can not only get all the vitamin-rich foods we want, we can even get extra vitamins. Like taking Fleischmann's yeast for vitamin B complex, I mean. That's right. And Fleischmann's yeast is the only yeast with all the other important vitamins shown on the Fleischmann label. So, friends, if you'd like to add more important vitamins to your diet, drink two cakes of Fleischmann's fresh yeast every day. Yes, drink it, America. To your health. <laughs> Richie, you trying to stand there and say that somebody is trying to do away with you by putting bugs and stuff into your medicine? I do not care to argue it with you. If you'll follow me to my room, I'll prove it to you. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'd like to see the inside of that room. I'll have to have it disinfected, but it's worth it. Well, while you have to have it disinfected, no one has ever been in that room but me. No one. It's kept scientifically pure. Oh, pew for you. Where will I gather up these little trophies out of the bureau drawer here? Cousin Louise... Keep away from me with that filthy snake. He's got laryngitis. Laryngitis? <gasps> sure. Would you spray his throat for him? No. No, I won't. Certainly not. <laughs> what a poor, fuzzy old dope. Now, you see here, you you young scamp. Oh, let him alone, Cousin Rich. It's just their way of having fun. They can't have Are you talking down your nose at me? Oh, go butter stuff. Belittling, that's all you do. All right, leave him alone, Doc. Stoney, go on back to your room. <laughs> People can't let you alone in this house. That's what's the matter. And to see that you stay in your room the rest of the night, Cousin Louise, I'm going to lock you in. There isn't any key, so what do you think about that? Where is it? I threw it down the hot air grill ages ago. Well, I wish you'd throw that darn reptile down the same place. A lock or no lock, if I catch you out of your room again tonight, I'm going to send you down to the detention home. And you won't like that, I can assure you. Yeah? Yeah. Would... Would they throw cold water on me? You can't tell what's liable to happen. So stay in your room and go to bed. Good night. Yeah. Oh, please hurry before all of my medicines are ruined. Okay. Hey, Jack, ain't that Uncle David's door standing open? What's that? Yeah, look. Ain't that Indian Mormo supposed to be with him? Come on. But you were going with me. Go to your room and wait. If everything's okay, we'll be right there. Yeah. Maybe it ain't nothing at all. Yeah, hold it. Don't go in. Yeah. Listen. Somebody? Why doesn't somebody come and take care of me? Hey, he is alone. Yeah. Let's go in. Why doesn't somebody come and take care of me? Nobody gives me any medicine or a... Hello. Hi, Uncle Daly. What's the matter? I haven't got anyone to take care of me. And my right arm's hurting me so. Where's Momo? I don't know. Hey, Jack. I'll bet you something that he's up in that secret room on the third floor. How long has he been gone? Hours. Oh, oh my right arm. Now, look, Uncle David, you haven't got any right arm. It, it hurts just the same. Well, what's the matter now? Someone is cutting my fingernails too close. Huh? Yes. Down almost to the quick. The quick on my fingers has always been so awfully sensitive. Yeah. Is there anything we can do for you? If, if only you'd find my right arm and see that it's buried. Oh, honest, Uncle David, the chances are that your arm's been buried now for two or three days. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. Okay, we'll look for the arm. Is there anything we can do for you right now? You, you see that bottle of medicine on the table? Hmm. What is this? says a uh, sleeping tablet. Yes. If I could have one of those, and if someone would stay with me. Well, Doc and I have got so much ground to cover. We... Oh, Doc, go get Jerry Booker. Oh, yeah. Out of Grandpa St. Eustace's room. That's a good idea. I... 
I mustn't be left alone while I'm asleep on account of my left arm. Your left arm? Here, let me see. You can't see very much. Why, your fingers are all taped up. What's the matter with them? Did you ever hear of a person being eaten alive? What? Yes. Eaten alive. Here. Let me untake one of those. No. No, please. They're so tender. Do you mean to tell me that while you lie there asleep... Jack. That... Jack, go quick. Doc, won't you? Sorry, what's the matter? Doc came to get me and found Reggie laid out in the hall. Knocked out? Yeah. Oh, you better hurry. Willie's not in her room. Willie's not... Sherry, you got that gun I gave you? Yeah. You stay right here in this room with Uncle David. Don't move out of it until I come for you. You got it? Got it. Good. Now, don't forget. I told Reggie to watch out. Hey, Jack, you coming? I'm coming, all right. Yes, sir. Reggie's really got himself a crack on the head this time. And Oh, here you are, fella. Here. Here, let me have a look. It looks kind of tough. Must have happened quite a few minutes ago. Look how the blood beginning to congeal on his face. Call an ambulance. There's a plug-in phone just inside Willie's room. Emergency hospital? Yeah, nothing we can do for him this time. Doggone it. Hey, Central, quick. Emergency hospital ambulance to the St. Eustace Griffin Mansion. Yeah, St. Eustace Mansion in Los Feliz Hills. Yeah, everybody knows where it's at. Yeah, hurry it up, will you, sugar? Get him. He's coming right up. Get a pillow off Willie's bed. Yeah, you bet you. Mm-hmm. Open the front of his shirt. Yeah. All right, here you are, son. Yeah, now let's roll him over easy so his head's on the pillow. Yeah. Easy. Mm-hmm. Careful. Yeah, that's it. Look like a fractured skull. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Hey, Jack, where's them two detectives the police left when they come and got their pal that was knocked out earlier tonight? Well, I don't know. Wouldn't say. Wouldn't say? Yeah, being very cagey. They got their own places to watch from so nobody could creep up on them. Well, they sure are doing a wonderful job of watching. Hey, look, we've just got to go get after Willie. Well, what about Reggie here? There's nothing to do till the ambulance gets here. It's all important to find Willie. Well, what do we do? Just start at the top of the house and search down? It's too long. We've got to pick up her trail and... Hey, isn't there a door open someplace? Oh, what you mean? Don't you feel a draft of air from outdoors? Yeah, now that you mention it. I... Hey, isn't there a hall doorway that leads out onto a balcony at the front of the house? Yeah, a great big old balcony. Runs the whole length across the front of the house. Yeah, well, I'm going to have a look. Well, son, where you go to, I go to in this boogie house. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Door on the balcony standing partly open. Yeah, but what does it mean? I don't know. Let's have a look. Quiet until we get to the door. Yeah. See anything? Yeah. Yeah, I see something all right. Yeah? Yeah. Take a peek. Careful. What do you see? What, Jack? Jack, it's Willie. Yeah. What else? She seems to be out there all by herself in some kind of a white training nightgown. Yeah. Look how her poor little white skulls, no hair on it, glistens in the moonlight. That's not moonlight. That's the street lights out on the road back of the house. Yeah, ain't no moon. What's she supposed to be doing? She's walking up and down the balcony saying something. I want to hear what it is. Well, we can't go out on the balcony without being seen. No, but if we go into this room off the hall and open the window that looks out onto the balcony. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Is it unlocked? Oh. Easy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah. This was Buck Thornton's room. Was, well, huh? Windows over this way. Can you open it without a sound? Here. Here, I'll give you a hand. Things of life, but the heap out of which the beautiful things grow. There she is. Listen. Perhaps all the members of the Griffin family will be given another chance on earth sometime. Yes, that's it. Given another chance. And next time they'll know better. Be stronger. Be more honorable. Wicked Walking up and down and making gestures like crazy folks. Yeah. He's hearing murders that drove her nuts, huh? Listen. We're all getting what we deserve. I know that. It's coming to us just like it says in the book. Just like it says in the book. But it ought to be easier than this. It ought to be 
Easier than that. Hello. Hey, quiet. You didn't think I'd find you, did you? There's no way to keep your voice down. I gotta tell you something. Oh, all right. Close the window, Doc. Don't make a sound. Uh huh. Okay, she's down. Now then, didn't I tell you to stay in your room? Sure, but you'll be glad I didn't when you know what I'm going to tell you. Well, what? Guess what's hanging out of the window by the neck? Hey, what did you say? Uh huh. With his own scarf for a rope. Cousin Richie. And that isn't all either. Yeah? Sure. His gloves are pulled out of his hands and stuffed in his mouth. Yeah. Yeah, they would be. And now your attention for just a moment. If you're planning to add more vitamins to your diet, read the Fleischmann's yeast label first. Note the many important vitamins you get in yeast. And mind you, Fleischmann's is the only yeast with all these vitamins. If you bake at home, remember that three of the vitamins in Fleischmann's yeast, B1, D, and G, are not appreciably lost in the oven. They go right into the bread. Help the Red Cross to help humanity. The Red Cross roll call starts tomorrow. Answer it promptly. The further adventures of Jack, Doc, and Reggie with the monster in the mansion will come to you next week at this same time. Now in preparation, Secret Passage to Death. I Love a Mystery, written by Carlton E. Morse, comes to you through the courtesy of the makers of Fleischmann's Fresh Yeast. dessert will make your family chorus, this is heaven. Royal orange coconut tapioca pudding. Because its heavenly ambrosia-like flavor comes from real oranges and real coconuts. Remember, the only way to get royal flavor is to say the name, Royal Puddings. This is the Blue Network of the National Broadcasting Company. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio